Sergeant, are we ready to go? Okay. Good afternoon. I'd like just to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Rafa Aspinall and Councilmember Chaim Deutsch. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management hearing on the Fiscal 2020 Preliminary Budget and the Fiscal Year 2019 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report for the Department of Sanitation and the Business Integrity Commission. My name is Antonio Reynoso. I am the Chair of the Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. Today we will hear testimony from the Department of Sanitation uh, on its expense budget, capital plan, and general agency operations. After we hear from DSNY, we will hear from the Business Integrity Commission on its expense budget and general agency operations. The Department of Sanitation's fiscal year 2020 expense budget totals $1.77 billion, which is $28.7 million more than fiscal year 2019, uh, uh, 2019 adopted budget. DSNY's commitment plan for fiscal year 2019 through 2030, 2023 totals approximately $2.1 billion, a decrease of $53 million, or 2.5% since the last budget adoption. The committee looks forward to discussing such important topics as efforts to align the city with achieving its goal of zero waste by 2030, a status update on the electronics and organics collection programs, and the various new needs included in the fiscal year 2020 preliminary plan. The Business Integrity Commission's uh, fiscal 2020 expense budget totals $9.3 .7, million, which is $634,000 more than the adopted budget. The committee looks forward to hearing the department's testimony on important topics, including enforcement, effort target, enforcement efforts targeting unlicensed waste haulers, as well as agency performance in reviewing applications. We'll first hear from Acting Commissioner Costas. Welcome. Uh, I, I don't know if this is your first, this is your first hearing. Um, it's a good first hearing to come to, uh, but welcome. And then proceed to hear from Commissioner Brunel from uh, the Business Integrity Commission. Uh, the committee will then hear from members of the public. We thank you in advance for your patience. Uh, I would like to thank our committee staff for all their help in preparing for today's hearing. Before we hear from Acting Commissioner Costas, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues again who are present, um, but would like to actually swear you in. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, welcome, commissioners. A uh, pleasure to have you in your acting capacity. While we love uh, Catherine Garcia, uh, we do are happy to have you here and are looking forward to your performance, and I expect um, only the best um, from you as I do for the rest of the DSNY team. So welcome and take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso and members of the City Council Committee on Sanitation and Solid Waste Management. I am Stephen Casas, Acting Commissioner of the New York City Department of Sanitation. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the department's portion of the Mayor's Fiscal Year 2020 Preliminary Budget, the Fiscal Year 2019 Preliminary Mayor's Management Report, and our current programs and operations. With me this afternoon are Larry Cipollina, Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Financial Management, Bridget Anderson, Deputy Commissioner for Recycling and Sustainability, and Gregory Anderson, Chief of Staff. As proposed, the fiscal 2020 preliminary budget allocates $1.77 billion in expense funds to the department, of which $1.04 billion is for personal services and $736 million is for, the other, than, is for other than personal services. Our fiscal year 2020 budgeted headcount is 10,029, including 7,721 full-time uniform and 2,308 full-time civilian positions. In addition, the department's proposed FY 2020 capital budget is approximately 565 million. Of this amount, 367 million is allocated to facility construction and rehabilitation. 9.7 million for information technology projects and 188 million to replace equipment and vehicles. The funding resources under the proposed FY 2020 budget will ensure that the department can continue to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. However, as the mayor stated in his budget announcement, we are facing new realities and tough choices. New York City's finances face strong headwinds and economic uncertainty. 
Clean streets and public spaces contribute to a better quality of life for New Yorkers that they expect and deserve. The proposed FY 2020 budget continues funding for the Mayor's Clean NYC initiative, including expanded Sunday and holiday litter basket collection service, highway ramp cleaning, and targeted cleaning and enforcement efforts in high need areas. In addition, in FY 2019, city council districts across the city have benefited from supplemental litter basket service funded in partnership with city council at budget adoption last year. On behalf of the department, I would like to thank all of you for the ongoing advocacy for cleaning resources and litter basket collection service. As a result of these investments, the department continues to maintain near record high scorecard cleanliness ratings across the city. Through February, the department has achieved a citywide average scorecard rating of 95.7% of streets rated acceptably clean, up from 94.7% the year prior. In addition, the department last year announced Better Bin, an international design com competition to reimagine New York City's standard litter baskets. Today, the department has more than 23,000 litter baskets on city streets, most of which are plain green wire baskets. In partnership with the Van Allen Institute, the Industrial Design Society of America, and the American Institute of Architects of New York, we've narrowed the pool down to three finalists. We are working with these finalists to refine their designs and produce prototypes for testing in New York City, New York City streets this summer. We look forward to working with the council and the public to garner feedback and select the winning design to be the next generation corner litter basket. Snow fighting is also a core component of the department's mission, ensuring safe travel for first responders, residents, and commuters. The FY 2020 preliminary budget is $111.8 million. Our current modified snow budget for FY19 is $99.5 million. So far, the department has experienced a winter season that has yielded lower overall snow accumulations to date than in the past few seasons. We have repeatedly had forecasted snow events that produced less snowfall than predicted or have changed terrain. As a result, we have activated for 18 events to this date this season for a total of 21 inches of snow. Following last November's snowstorm and the cascading traffic impacts that resulted, we have already begun to implement changes to our winter storm preparations and response. For the last several events, we have improved coordination between the Department of Sanitation, Transportation, Police and Emergency Management, and the MTA, coordinating earlier on in-forecast in cycle and taking steps to improve communication during winter weather events. The department now sends a representative to the Department of Transportation's Joint Traffic Management Center in Long Island City to provide improved situational awareness. In addition, the preliminary budget includes 2.1 million in expense funds and 8.6 million in capital funds to implement initiatives identified following the November snowstorm. These include the purchase of 10 large and 14 small brine trucks. Brine, which is liquefied salt, can be applied in advance of a winter weather event. Like rock salt, it inhibits the accumulation of snow and ice on roadways and can improve driving conditions during a snowstorm. We have already begun testing the brine pretreatment and we will continue to, eva to evaluate its performance. The preliminary budget also includes capital funds in FY 2019 to purchase 10 additional salt spreaders to provide dedicated service along highways and critical roadways throughout a snow event. These spreaders will be accompanied by NYPD highway escort to enable them to travel as needed through traffic or in circumstances like the November snowstorm against the flow of traffic to improve traffic, traction, re relieve traffic caused by disabled vehicles. In 2006, the New York City Council adopted and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation approved the city's solid waste management plan known as SWAMP. The SWAMP is a fair five borough plan to sustainably manage New York City's waste and offer flexibility and resiliency in case of a natural disaster or other emergency. The plan provides New York City with a world-class infrastructure and mandates a shift from waste export by long-haul trucks 
to a system of marine and rail transfer stations spread throughout the five boroughs. Over the last four years, the department has worked to complete construction of these new marine transfer stations. The North Shore MTS in Queens was the first to open in March of 2015. Later this month, on March 25th, we will open the East 91st Street MTS. These MTSs are state-of-the-art facilities designed to operate sustainably and resiliently. They have rapid roll-up doors, negative air pressure systems, advanced ventilation and odor controls, and extensive floor proofing. The opening of the East 91st Street MTS is the final step in implementing the city's long-term waste export program under the swamp that has resulted in the reduction of truck travel associated with the waste export by more than 60 million miles per year, including more than 5 million miles in and around New York City. It will also cut greenhouse gas emissions associated with waste transport by more than 34,000 tons annually and contribute to a more equitable distribution of waste management infrastructure in New York City. The commercial waste sector also plays an important role in achieving our zero waste goals. Offices, stores, restaurants, and other commercial establishments generate an estimated 3 million tons of waste a year. In November, we released our implementation plan for a comprehensive reform of the commercial waste industry, commercial waste zones. A plan to reform, reroute, revitalize private carting in New York City lays out a blueprint for the implementation of commercial waste collection zones across New York City. The plan will create a safe, efficient collection system for commercial waste that provides high quality, low cost service while advancing the city's zero waste goals. Two weeks ago, the department released a draft generic environmental impact statement for the implementation plan. Next week, we will hold two public hearings to receive comments on this document. The first hearing is scheduled on the morning of Monday, March 11th, and the second will be held in the evening on Thursday, March 14th. We will also accept written comments from the public through March 25th. We look forward to your input, as well as continuing our work with the City Council and the stakeholders in this important process. To support the City's goal of sending zero waste to landfills by 2030, the proposed budget allocates a total of $14.2 million in FY 2020 to the Department's Bureau of Recycling and Sustainability for Waste Prevention, Recycling and Sustainability Programs, including outreach, partnerships, and service provisions to residents, schools, agencies, and NYCHA. In addition, this proposed budget allocates $36 million to the Division of Solid Waste Management for our contracted recycling and composting vendors. New Yorkers are recycling more than ever, and DSNY collected more recycling material last year than at any year over the past decade. The city's overall diversion rate has reached 20.9%, the highest rate in nearly two decades. The department continues to focus on diverting organics, food scraps, food soil, paper, and yard waste from landfills, where they generate methane gas. Curbside organics collection serves 23 districts in the Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Buildings in the rest of the Bronx and Manhattan may enroll to receive collection. In January, we reached the milestone of establishing more than 150 food scrap drop-off sites to provide residents without curbside service the opportunity to compost their food scraps. In addition, more than 1,000 schools and institutions and agency locations now receive organic collection service. In FY 2018, New York has diverted over 73,000 tons of organics, a 45% increase over the prior year. The preliminary budget allocates funding in FY 2019 for 115 additional sanitation workers to fully fund existing curbside collection. However, the department is not funded to continue the expansion of curbside organics program to the remaining 16 districts at this time. We remain focused on providing efficient and reliable service in districts that already have curbside organics collection, and we are focused on working in those districts to increase participation and identify additional operating efficiencies. The mayor remains committed to expanding the curbside organics collection, but we know that we must do so in a financially sustainable way to be successful in the long term.
Despite this, we are actively working to grow organics programs in other ways. This fall, we will expand the number of schools participating in the organics program by converting three existing school truck routes to organics collection. In addition, we will add additional city agencies and institutions to existing organics collection routes as called for by Local Law 22 of 2019, passed by the City Council last year. We will also continue to recruit large apartment buildings to join the program, especially in areas where collection service already exists. We look forward to working with the members of the Council, community boards, and other groups to educate and motivate New Yorkers to improve participation in the program. This month, we will launch a new food, food donation portal to connect businesses seeking to donate food with organizations seeking to feed people. This portal is part of the next phase of our Donate NYC program and will help reduce food waste before it is, gets thrown out. The tool created pursuant to Local Law 176 of 2017 prioritizes neighborhood-based local food donations. Beyond organics, our portfolio of textiles and e-waste recovery programs continues to grow, both in participation and in material recovered. In FY 2018, the department partnered to recover nearly 19,000 tons of textiles through Fashion NYC, clothing drop-off locations, and through Donate NYC partners. Additionally, in late February, the department and our Donate NYC partners hosted Refashion Week NYC, a first-of-its-kind event celebrating sustainability and reuse in fashion. The week-long celebration included events across New York City, such as pop-up market, clothing swaps, a mending and upcycling workshop, and a refashion show, all focused on reducing textile waste and making fashion sustainable. As fast fashion wear becomes more popular and accessible, the amount of textile waste is also expected to grow. Refashion Week New York City aims to connect the fashion world, sustainability experts, the reuse industry, and consumers by raising public awareness of textile waste. And we look forward to hosting and popularizing this event annually with our Donate NYC partners. In FY 2018, the department recycled roughly 30,000 tons of electronics through eCycle NYC drop-off events. Excuse me, 3,000 tons of electronics through eCycle NYC drop-off events and the appointment-based e-waste collection program. In FY 2020, we will expand household e-waste collection to the rest of Queens and the Bronx. The department also continues its popular safe disposal program offering five permanent waste disposal drop-off sites and, and 10 borough-wide safe disposal events per year, plus smaller pop-up events hosted by community partners. In FY 2018, our SAFE program diverted over 600 tons of household hazardous material for safe and proper recycling. One of the greatest challenges to recycling in New York City when compared to other American cities is the enormous density and diversity of the building stock. Storage space, signage, and the level of custodial service are among important factors for recycling compliance in our large, dense city. Despite the multitude of convenient collection programs we provide, New, York, New Yorkers, we provide New Yorkers to recycle or reuse waste, we know that education and outreach are critical to increasing participation in these programs and achieving our zero waste goals. That is why in FY 2018, the department launched launched a zero waste building management training program to train and support building staff to improve the setup of pre-collection storage areas in their buildings that will facilitate better waste management and source separation recycling practices of building residents. During the first year of the program, the department had over 75 participants with nearly 100% graduation rate. The zero waste building management training team continues and we expect it will grow in 2019. As you also know, some of New York City's waste stream is influenced heavily by state law. We are closely monitoring legislation impacting the bottle bill, more formally known as the New York State Returnable Container Law, and the single-use carry-out bags which state legislature is currently presently considering. In coming weeks, we hope to continue discussions with the chair and this committee towards our mutual goal of focusing on solutions 
and policy mechanisms to address these materials in our waste stream. Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to remind New Yorkers that our phone ban at last took effect on January 1st. Businesses may no longer offer or sell foam food service products and loose fill packing material in New York City. Last December, the department sent a mailer out to affected city businesses and outreach and education efforts will continue through the six month warning period. Businesses that continue to use or sell phone products will be subject to violations beginning on John, July 1st. In closing, I would like to thank Chair Reynoso and the other members of this committee for continuing your support of our programs and work. You are critical, you are critical partners as we work to keep New York City healthy, safe, and clean. Thank you for this opportunity to testify this afternoon. My staff and I are now happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we covered a lot of ground there, so we'll do the best we can to try to get some questions in here that might make sense uh, to dive deeper into uh, the 2020 preliminary budget. Um, the first question, I wanna uh, show this uh, um, uniform and overtime budget versus actual overtime spending. So, so we're usually off by a bit, but this year, uh, or last year, we were off by quite like 33% um, in overtime spending. And we, and then this year it looks like uh, you compensated for that and prepared to just pay off more overtime. Um, and it looks like we, m we might not hit it uh, or we will hit it. Uh, so I guess what operational changes are happening that account for this increase in overtime, this significant increase in overtime? So there were a couple of contributing factors to that over time. Uh, one being the uh, 23 districts that are currently receiving organics collection, the uh, head count that we were required to be able to cover that without overtime was 115 sanitation workers. Um, we have now been given the green light to actually do that hiring of 115 sanitation workers, and that is going forward. We hope to have the class uh, by mid-April in school and that will uh, definitely impact where the overtime was. Uh, another contributing factor was this past summer, uh, sanitation salvage uh, license was revoked, and for several weeks, the Department of Sanitation actually provided collection service to all their businesses in Manhattan and the Bronx. So that was another uh, big contributor to that overtime. Uh, so, so I got two questions from that. Um, and if you've seen the most recent report from Kira Feldman uh, related to uh, Five Star uh, Waste now, which the city actually does business with, um, is there a budget to prepare or to, that exists um, that accounts for the possibility of the suspension or shutdown of private carters that you would have to assume the responsibility of picking up trash for um, that, is not, that, is, that is separate from your, separate from I guess having to be addressed by overtime, just like its own budget? Uh, no, it is not budgeted itself. That was supplemental service. Um, unfortunately, it ran as long as it did. Okay, so just um, considering the new work that's being done at BIC and, and the oversight that's happening related to private sanitation, we should have a conversation about maybe having some money put aside so that we could be efficient in how we spend it in the case where we have to assume the responsibilities of these private sanitation folks. Okay. Just uh, so that we don't see this big spike um, related to that. Uh, you said 115 workers. Um, in the testimony, is that 115 additional sanitation workers to fully fund existing curbside collection service. Then you wrote, however, the department is not funded to continue expansion of the curbside organics programs, program to the remaining 16 districts at this time. Those are two, com those are two completely different sentences, right? I just want to make sure they're not connected, they're not related, um, right? 115 are, is an increase in headcount? Is that what Correct. we're talking about? Currently, right now, we are approved to hire an additional 115 sanitation workers. An increase in headcount, though, not, so, so you, there's going to be 115 more workers overall in the Department of Sanitation. As that hiring takes place, yes. Yes, and then it's funded for 2020. It is funded for 2019. In 2020, That's, it is not yet funded. Right. And, but, so this is a preliminary budget. 
So what is gonna happen to these 115 workers in 2020? Uh, the, so the 115 sanitation workers that come on board in April was an ask from uh, last year. Um, OMB did give us the green light to hire them. So come July 1st, uh, if that green light does not exist, the sanitation workers obviously will be on payroll. That would probably come out of uh, additional hiring classes, would potentially maybe reduced by that number. All right, so why, why not just permanently increase headcount um, and account for this long term instead of just a one year? Uh, it's obvious, what I hear there is existing curbside collection service. So this is not an, expan an expansion of services. This is just to do the work that we currently do. So why not maintain them, why not budget for that long term? Uh, so we are still working with OMB and trying to get all that clarified and as well as deal with the new budget realities in terms of, um, of providing service. So the department's mission is still to provide the highest quality of service for street cleaning, snow removal, and mm -hmm. uh, all our typical services. But we're working with OMB on that. Okay. It's, a, it's important that we, we think about this long term. You're talking about doing current work, not new work just curbside collection. And if you want to do that the right way, you felt that you needed 115 new workers last year. I assume that you're going to need the same amount of people this year. Um, so if I don't see it in the budget, I'm going to feel like you're going to be 115 people short to do the work that you're mandated to do, I guess, or that's your responsibility. So that's concerning that it's not in the budget long term. That's all I'm saying. And I hope that you advocate for it um, to OMB and, the, and, and to the mayor's office. It's extremely concerning. It's a large number. Correct. Um, yes, and then, then organics. We talked about organics over time. What have we done to modify so that we don't see this exorbitant number when it comes to overtime? So 9.6 million of that was directly related to uh, the lack of having those sanitation workers. So once we have the 115 on board, they will clearly offset what was being run in terms of overtime related to organics collection. And have you done a cost benefit analysis on, on whether or not it's more beneficial to hire 115 workers or just give overtime to the folks that are doing it now? The hiring obviously is cheaper. So the hiring is more affordable, okay. That's good to know because um, I see a $132 million worth of salaries that we could be working towards as opposed to um, what I think is a waste, wasteful spending of overtime, and we could just hire the people appropriately. And if there's a cost-benefit analysis that has been made that it's more affordable to do this, then we, we should be considering that. Uh, it's just very concerning to not see the 115 long-term. Just don't know why you would hire one shot. And then I guess through attrition, the folks would just leave. Um, it doesn't add up. I just want to make sure we, we, we clear the, this up because it's, it's not adding up. It's not. So uh, for fiscal year 2019 to date, what is the tonnage percentage of organic material captured? I'm sorry? Uh, the organic material that you've captured as of fiscal year 2019? Uh, so we captured 34,000 tons of uh, organics, uh, which included yard waste, leaves, green markets, uh, Christmas tree collections, and school collection. Have you seen an improvement in yes, that number from year, year to date? Yes, we have seen an overall increase. Okay. Um, is there a strategy or new work that's being done that is increasing the amount of organics or is it just uh, folks are volunteering more, just the performance, uh, education, information? What, is, what, is it, what can we attribute to the fact that there's been a slight increase in the organics collection? Uh, so currently the department uh, continues to pursue zero by 30 aggressively. Uh, we have our, our recycling outreach unit uh, with boots on the ground, working with schools in terms of trying to uh, get them on board with organics collection, as well as going door to door, engaging residents to see if they are putting out their brown pail, if they're not, why they aren't participating. So we're, we're going door to door if necessary, going to all types of local events, uh, community driven, working with elected officials to try and get the word out. We host various uh, compost giveaways to try and uh, get the word out on organics and let them know uh, what it looks like when they throw it out and what it can be turned into. How many folks are going door to door? Do you, um, 
or um, Uh, the number varies a little bit depending on the district. We have some special language folks that we would deploy temporarily in certain cases, but I would say on average it's about 15 people at a time, at any one time. Do we know their success rate um, in, you know, they knock on 10 doors, two people join the program, do, or do you see an increase in the tonnage that is uh, taken in by DSNY after like a week of having a couple of people go door knocking in in that area? Is there is there some data collection that's happening? But we, we do periodic surveys where we look to see where we've done door to door and then um, how many people are setting out the brown bin and after the fact how many people have increased and we do see that there is consistent increase in, in setting out the brown bin after we've gone door to door. Okay, so I want Periodic surveys to do that. Okay, so I want to do like another, this cost benefit. Mm -hmm. um, Sending one person to one block saves the city how much money in the fact that we've converted them into organics recyclers. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have that information as to uh, you know, uh, how much money the city saves for every you know, five pounds of, of organics that are, is being thrown into a, into a sanitation truck? Like, are we doing that? Uh, are we having that conversation at all? We, we have various analyses, and I, we haven't done that one in particular, but we can certainly um, work with you to provide any analysis that would be helpful. Yeah, I think that would be helpful because yeah. then we could really see, uh, you know, whether or not we might need 100 people going door to door because of the value that they bring in the return on organics participation by our residents. I think that would be a great conversation to have. I've recently been recycling our, my organics. I just moved into a two-family home. I got yes, And I'm, I'm having a great time doing it so far. Um, one of my bags had a leak on it, so it wasn't the fun, but for the most part, it, it's been fun. The truck hasn't come it, because of the snow. It didn't come last week, so I have to wait till Wednesday for them to pick it, but I feel good because it's gonna be a very heavy load of uh, organics. Um, I talked to my neighbor. Uh, I told him it's a voluntary program. If you want to, you can be a part of it. Uh, and yesterday I saw a different bag inside the organics bin, so that means that they are participating. And I didn't tell them anything. I just said, hey, it's organics. They have this little trash can. You could take it. It's up to you. And he was like, he took it. He barely talked to me. We don't even talk. Um, but he participated, which I think is the valuable thing. It took very little to get this person to start their organics program. So uh, the Brooklyn run is going to be like five, six pounds heavier every single, every single time. So I'm excited about that. Great. I'm very happy about that. I'm very excited about it. But I want to see if they door knock on my block, whether we get everyone to participate. Um, that, would be, that would be exciting. So if we can do that analysis, it would be helpful because then maybe next year I can advocate for more people knocking on doors because ultimately it could save money um, for the city of New York. Um, <clears throat> I want uh, organics expanded citywide, uh, and under the uh, zero waste, I think a big part of uh, getting to zero waste is everyone being able to recycle organics. And can we put the next slide? And we've shown we've shown this slide before, um, and this is this is how it, it's uh, it's factual, but it doesn't say the whole story, right? And I, and I want to allow for the Department of Sanitation to be able to tell the whole story because if you just see this. It is concerning that we're moving at a very slow rate when it comes to diversion. We have programs that the city is interested in implementing that are really, really start aggressively moving that, that trend line uh, further north. And I wanna kinda allow for you to take a moment to speak to that because it's very important to us uh, that we understand that we're, there is an opportunity to get to that goal uh, and just want to give you an opportunity to speak to that. Um, so, as you mentioned, uh, the, our ability to reach that goal comes in various forms. Um, we, our e-waste program has proven to be extremely successful to this point in terms of how much e-waste has actually been removed from the waste stream. Uh, we're currently doing that either by appointment or through uh, residents being able to bring their e-waste to a drop-off point. Uh, the textiles also have been a huge success to, to date um, in terms of uh, our refashion week that just took place. Um, in addition to that, 
we uh, continue to work with our other partners on, you know, hosting 10 large events for hazardous household waste drop-offs, and we have additional five pop-up events which provide convenient options for residents to safely dispose of paint, batteries, and electronics. Um, ultimately, we diverted over 600 tons of household waste, hazardous waste from the waste stream. So we continue to do any other, uh, other than organics, there are other things that we continue to do to engage the public and get them interested in what we're doing. So all the initiatives that you talked about, plus organic citywide, are the two, I guess, or not the two, but you talked a lot about a lot of initiatives. Are those the two, the, the two programs or the two initiatives that are gonna get us to that goal line? certainly going to contribute and help us get there, yes. Is there anything else that you're not talking about that could contribute to achieving zero waste that we're not paying attention to or that haven't, hasn't been mentioned yet? For uh, continued expansion from the 23 districts to citywide organics collection. And, I, and that's it? I don't think you're going to get there that way. I think you got to be more aggressive. Um, we're working on so many fronts. Uh, and one of the things that we're trying to do is, is be disruptive. So we have a lot of private sector and public sector partnerships, nonprofit partnerships, where we're trying to change the dialogue and change behavior through, um, not necessarily through curbside collection activity, but through waste reduction, through policy change. We're um, actively you know, paying attention to what happens at the state level because that influences highly how, what we achieve at the local level in terms of um, disrupting our um, are just our behavior patterns. And so part of this is you don't, behavior change takes time, and so we're, we're setting up partnerships and programs that, um, that help us disrupt that behavior. And so we're not necessarily seeing the impacts we want immediately. The other thing that we, we think about a lot is um, what are we measuring? So reuse is something that we've been focusing a lot on in terms of how do we measure the reuse activity in the city that isn't measured in this graph that is um, this is curbside only so how do we actually have a more holistic definition of what is zero waste and, and what are the achievements that we're making so we're trying to work on how do we better define even the success and the achievements that we are seeing that's that's not just simply the curbside line and then save as you throw is something else that i think is going to be very important we're either gonna, it's a carrot or stick, one or the other. You guys are going with an incentive program to try to, or we're thinking about going through an incentive program to try to encourage people to uh, recycle appropriately. Um, where are we with that study at this point? Uh, because I actually think Save As You Throw is gonna be, could be extremely helpful in helping us achieve zero waste. So clearly, Save As You Throw was a component of 1NYC. Um, as Commissioner Garcia used to say, um, and as we still very strongly believe, the first step is to offer as many services as possible to New Yorkers so that they can divert as much of their waste as possible. Until we get to that point and have full, uh, full service in terms of organics, e-waste, textiles, um, I think that, that it's, it's sort of too early to focus on the incentives if you don't have the program for someone to participate in. Yeah, but it's not up too early to study so that if and when we want it to be done, we can kind of move quickly. Uh, it's 2030. It's, it's right around the corner. It's in 10 years. Uh, so why haven't we moved forward with the study? Or is, there, is the study budgeted, I guess, in the, in, in the 2020 budget, if I look into it? Is, there, is it going to show a study related to, wait, to Save As You Throw? So at this time, we are not budgeted for a study on Save As You Throw. But, it, but it's, in, it's your initiative, it's in 1NYC, why is it not budgeted? That is correct. We are focused at this point on expanding services as much as we can. Okay, I'm just saying, uh, I don't wanna have a fight with the administration on their initiative, all right? And your initiative is zero waste. I, I wanna be a partner in helping you achieve that. I just think we need to be a little more aggressive. And I think at least studying the Save As You Throw program could go a long way. Um, you know, I know the political support right now is not there, and we have to make sure that we, we build public opinion, but I think we can do that with facts and information. Um, and once we get that, we see a lot of things change. The study related to the private sanitation industry and the fact that they have inefficient routes um, helped us be able to uh, build a narrative for moving forward with way zoning. Um, maybe if we have a study, it can help us make uh, the case uh, that 
we should be doing something related to Save Zero Twelve. Um, that's all I'm saying. Uh, we can build political buy-in by having the information. And I, I think a number of advocates in this room uh, sitting behind us would agree with you, and we're happy to have conversations with you and other stakeholders about how to do that in a way that doesn't necessarily have budgetary implications. Because there is, so, so thank you for that. I appreciate that answer. I know we're on the same team. I just think publicly we need to put pressure on each other, hold each other accountable um, to get things done. Uh, but my biggest concern is the organics program. That is my biggest concern. There doesn't seem to be, again, an, it's your initiative, something you say you want to do, but then I see 115 members that are not necessarily funded for the year after. Um, we're still not at all the districts that we want to be in. It's just a lot of things that are not happening. Uh, and again, I'm concerned that you might not be taking it as serious as you want to take it because it's your initiative, not mine. Again, I want to be a partner, but I have to hold you accountable. You guys are falling extremely short in providing the funding necessary to do a, a more robust and complete uh, uh, um, organics program. I'm very concerned about that. Um, and this, this preliminary budget speaks to my concerns. Uh, so it's your information and your initiative that you guys are not pushing. Um, 115 people that were there this year because you needed it, they should be there next year. So I just want to emphasize that organics is extremely important to me and I think to you and I don't think uh, we're there. So hopefully in our next budget hearing, I get a different answer related to the 115 people that were hired before so that we can start taking organics seriously. Um, and I don't think I need to tell you this, uh, cost benefit just saves us so much more money in the long term. Instead of spending almost $450 million to export waste, if we divert it, it saves us money. So these 115 people could be a long-term savings for us um, in the city of New York. Uh, so I just want to re-emphasize, we are falling short on organics, and we need to do more. Uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to talk about something I talked about last, last term, um, a request for more information and marketing by DSNY. What is your current budget for marketing? and getting information out and educating the general public. Oh my God. Nicole. So the current budget on marketing and outreach is about $2.5 million. Um, although that uh, number has not increased, we are still doing, uh, as Commissioner Anderson mentioned, uh, a lot of door-to-door -door and grassroots uh, reach out, outreach to the public. So what we've been doing is concentrating on the 23 districts that are currently on the program in terms of uh, trying to increase participation. Uh, at the same time, we've also been uh, partnering with uh, private organizations who can help us in terms of doing some advertising. We've been able to uh, acquire some pro bono work. Uh, currently in Times Square, there are three billboards that are running uh, 15 second segments uh, related to sanitation that discuss that actually show organics collection up there and uh, if we put a price tag on that right now the department is getting it for free uh, the price tag for that would have been uh, over twenty two thousand dollars a week so it's already been running and will continue to run uh, for the foreseeable future so we've been fortunate in that sense that uh, uh, Bridges group has been extremely creative in terms of uh, gaining additional support on the advertising side. So, uh, and with all due respect, like, I don't want us to rely on charity necessarily to get our message out. I think it's smart and it's, we have to take advantage of it, so I'm grateful for it, but there should be uh, an intentional uh, marketing that's happening, um, again, more robustly about getting to zero waste. And I don't think that we have the budget that speaks to that. Um, I actually think that uh, alongside climate change, uh, I think waste is a big contributor to that and is a big, when you talk about all encompassing, when we talk about our future, uh, waste has to be a big part of it. And right now it's not a part of the conversation. Um, and I think your budget for, for outreach uh, is, is, the mi is a minor leagues of budgets compared to other agencies that are trying to actually aggressively address an issue. And I always compare us uh, zero waste to vision zero. Vision zero, is doing something that is major leagues, which is television ads, where people are, or, or ads on, on the internet. When people are watching a show that they like or a baseball game, a Vision Zero ad will come up 
and very shockingly let people know the dangers that exist um, when you're a, a vehicle driver. Uh, we don't have that same level of, of aggressiveness when it comes to zero waste. Uh, so this year, instead of the 10 million, I'm actually asking for 2.5 million from the city of New York, an increase of 2.5 for your budget. So I wanna double it so we can start being more aggressive about educating people. So it's, everything I'm doing, I think long-term saves us money. Uh, nothing I'm saying here is that we're supposed to spend money for the sake of spending it. Information gets people to buy in and starts changing this culture that you're talking about. Well, I think the most effective way would be door-to-door. -door. It's an effective tool. Um, the conversions you get there are probably much higher than somebody that watches an ad. But when we talk about a city that has over 8 billion, pe 8 billion people in it, 8 million. Oof. It was like, oh, we beat China only in New York. Um, 8 million people in it. We have to think about more creative ways to get that message across. And I think, you know, doing the door knocking, doing ads on Times Square is really like not, it, it really speaks to, I think, a, a, a level that's not, that doesn't meet the urgency of the problem. Okay. So I think your marketing budget needs to go up so that we can start saving money and having people join programs that are gonna, again, assist us um, in reaching zero waste. And I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but we never get the money. We never get the money. Um, So there's a $1.27 million in fiscal year 2019 uh, for local service enhancements. Can we just go over what exactly that means and, and can we just get a breakdown of what that money is for? It says uh, local service enhancements, 1.27 for 2019 and growing to 1.69 million in the out years. So I just wanna get, it, it speaks to basket collection service and illegal dumping enforcement. So um, in regards to those enhanced services, that relates to Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. Um, basically, uh, DSNY in consultation with various uh, districts and different community concerns uh, came up with this additional basket collection service and to help offset some illegal dumping and enforcement in those areas. The 2019 budget negotiated by the council as 3.5 million was included in the adopted budget for litter basket service, uh, but not in fiscal year 2020. Why was this funding not included? This is another service that was requested by the city council to have uh, expanded uh, basket service and it's not in this year. Uh, the 3.5 million that was actually funded by city council uh, took us through July, so uh, through June 30th. So you're not gonna pick that up this year? It's something that, it's an initiative that you expect the council to pick up or that we pay for? Yes. Yes, so it was a one-shot deal. We need to negotiate. What I'm trying to do is negotiate it to be baseline mm -hmm. um, so that we can have uh, the, the basket service permanent, I guess, in, in the, in the so, uh, agency. As a result of that, uh, we were, we saw some positive feedback obviously in our scorecard ratings where 93% of our districts actually increased their scorecard rating over the previous year. So we had 55 of our 59 districts actually increase on their scorecard rating by the additional services. So we wanna keep that grade high. Sure. So we wanna keep the service, but it's not included in your budget. Right, because so we, we don't have a problem having to renegotiate that number now that we've done better. Uh, maybe we don't need as many people, but the 3.5 million was supposed to provide a service that I think actually worked and succeeded in the fact that we have higher, higher grade marks. Um, why not keep that um, or allow it to continue to exist if, if we're successful? Um, so part of the challenge is the new economic reality in New York City, and we're responding accordingly to these mandatory saving targets, and we hope that New York City will 
still be able to, uh, will be, still be able to provide efficient and core priorities to the public. And, and I think we're gonna just disagree on the, we want services to remain exactly the same. Um, and uh, if we saw a difference from one year to the next on the cleanliness of these streets because of a program, I'm concerned that the service is, is gonna go away and we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna go back to a quality of life that we, that we were used to in the past. Um, so I just wanna make sure that we don't, we don't decrease service in the cuts that we're asking for. And I just wanna inform you that the city council has actually gone back and gone through our own uh, systems by which we think the city can save funding or save money um, that doesn't cut service. Uh, and we hope that uh, you pay attention to that because I think there's some recommendations for the Department of Sanitation. So we can get to the number that the mayor is looking for without cutting service. Um, and what I'm hearing here now with the 115 people or workers and this uh, $3.5 million cut to basket service is that we might be losing service. It's concerning to me. Um, and again, I want, uh, I'll be better next hearing to outline what we think those cost savings can be and we can, we can have a conversation about that. Okay. Um, but I do, I know uh, Councilmember Cabrera is here and I wanna give him some time to ask some questions. Councilmember Cabrera. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have uh, just one qu quick question. Uh, as you know, uh, China in 2017 came up uh, with the national SOAR policy, which basically uh, they're no longer receiving plastic, uh, importing plastics uh, from nations, and that accounted about 45% of all the world's plastic was ending up in China. So I'm curious to know where is our plastics going to? at uh, this moment. Uh, so currently our uh, recycling pro program still, uh, we're still bringing our material to our vendors. Um, there is no doubt that there will be uh, impact based on China's decision to change what they classify as contaminated recycling. Um, on the end point, I do not know uh, in terms of if they've actually stopped receiving from the vendors that we bring our material to. Um, Bridget? So uh, New York City is um, somewhat insulated to this problem compared to many other cities um, in the country because we have a long-term contract with Sims and because we have such a high volume of material, we've been able to secure a lot of domestic markets for our material. It doesn't completely insulate us. Um, so with paper, mixed paper especially, we do have some challenges finding those outlets. But um, plastics especially, we, we have pretty good relationships with domestic outlets. So we're... we're we're watching it very closely, and it's certainly, it, it's hurting, but it's not di as dire as it is in many other places. So. so how long is that contract for? Our contract with Sims is a 20-year contract with um, another, with two 10-year optional renewals. And so it expires when? It started in 2008. 2008. Uh, 10 years so, in. so we have a long, we have a, we have a long relationship there. And we have a state-of-the-art um, facility to sort the material to get the highest value commodities out of it. So, so we're halfway through. We're, ha we're halfway through the first contract, yep, yeah, or the first term, exactly. And so how much of our plastics and papers are ending up right now in the landfill? What percentage? We are, we are finding markets for all of the recyclables. All that of we, them? Yep, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yep, they're just, sometimes the, the cost isn't, you know, the value is not as high, um, and we're having to be creative, but um, we are finding outlets at this point. So, so. The, the forecast is that it's going to get more difficult, I foresee, as we move forward, right? There are, um, the, restrict, the export restrictions continue to be tight. We are seeing a lot of investment domestically. There are paper mills that are putting in equipment to help take more mixed paper. So we're really relying on a lot of um, private sector investment, which is happening now, to help create domestic markets. So wh what's gonna happen once you hit the wall? You know, the point where, you know, there won't be such a market for it. We're hoping we don't hit a wall, right? Okay. <laughs> and so I, this is but something- But it, it looks like it's going in that direction, right? So I would say nationally, this is a huge conversation is how do we actually invest domestically in our ability to recycle our materials here as opposed to exporting them? Because of the study that was done at University of Georgia, uh, it was a very good study, as a matter of fact, they're finding that a lot of municipalities are having 
uh, the plastics and the paper literally being thrown back into the landfill, which is kind of yes. frustrating, I would imagine, for constituents. You're making us do all this work only to end up in the same place. Yes. And so that's really uh, one of my biggest fears yep. that we work so hard to change the culture and then to yep. go back to, uh, to a place where people don't see the value, you right. know. I would say we 100% agree with you there that, that we, we do not intend to roll back on recycling and that one of the things that our long-term contract has allowed is that we've invested in this really state-of-the-art facilities that many other parts of the state and the country don't have. And so we have a large volume of material which helps us secure domestic market uh, contracts that other cities aren't as, as privy to. So like I said, we're, we're not totally insulated, but we're, we're in a much better shape and we're watching it daily. We're watching very closely what's happening. Do we do we make money or do we have to pay? Both. <laughs> okay. So how we does receive that revenue, uh, ten dollars a ton revenue for our paper, um, and we do pay a tip fee for our metal glass plastic. Okay. Do you see the price going up for plastic, or is that or is that contract was uh, already secure? There's a. Um, we have a fairly consistent tip fee rate. Um, we do receive some revenue share from those materials when the markets are good. Okay, so. all right, thank you so much. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. So speaking of, of Sims, uh, we have a, a bottle bill that is being heard at the state level. And I'm extremely concerned about what I've seen so far uh, because uh, I just, I guess I wanted to get your take on what you think the best way to modify our bottle bill, our bottle, uh, what do you call that? Bottle revenue service? What, what would we call it? Uh, yes, thank you. Sorry, bottle redemption. How would how would you uh, build an ideal bottle redemption plan? Because um, I want to make sure we protect the city of New York and how we do this. But we also have a lot of people in our streets that rely heavily on 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 this service. I want to make sure it's viable long term. So we are definitely uh, monitoring the bottle bill discussions in the state very closely. Um, it is something that is very closely related to, as Councilmember Cabrera mentioned, the revenues that Sims is able to get from the recycling stream. Those revenues then, uh, as Commissioner Anderson mentioned, are passed on to the Department of Sanitation through our contract. So we are monitoring it closely. I think that really the, the key factor here is that the bottle bill is a, a bedrock foundation of recycling in New York State. It existed before curbside recycling existed, and it has diverted a significant amount of material. We continue to support the bottle bill as it exists today, but we do have some concerns about the way that the potential expansion is structured. Um, there is value in the material that it would take out of the stream, and we want to make sure that the state uh, and state legislature, as they're considering this expansion, talks to recycling processors, talks to municipalities, including us, including other municipalities across the state, to really understand what those implications could be. And, and I'm sorry, now we're getting into policy a little bit, but what, what do you think is good policy? Um, is what we're doing now, can, can what we're doing now be done better? Um, what we know is a lot of the canners that exist in our city um, go after the valuable stuff, That's but everything is five cents now. Um, what would you do to, I guess, encourage a, a system that allows for them to continue their work, but also um, maximize the amount of product you're getting so that we're not subsidizing SIMS and so forth? So I think the, the key thing that we look at, um, and you know, I think we, we have a lot of respect for the work that the canners are doing, um, but when we look at our, our waste stream, which we do on a regular basis, we testified last summer on the waste characterization study, and we look at, at what's in the metal, glass, and plastic stream, and how valuable is that material. And unfortunately, the glass that we're collecting, because of the fact that it's mixed together, it's mixed with other products, all the different colors of glass get smashed and mixed together, and it's very difficult um, for, that, for those products to be separated in a way that, that can then be sold to make new products. It's really the glass that we should be focused on in terms of getting that out of the curbside recycling stream. Because um, if you can keep it separate, if you can keep the clear glass and the green glass and the brown glass in separate, uh, separate streams, then you can actually potentially take that glass 
and make it into new glass products rather than downcycling it into uh, aggregate material or, or something along those lines. So that's where we would suggest that we focus, but we're, we're very much engaged in the conversation at the state level and we're, we're watching it very closely. Good. So in, in a facility in my district that does this canning work, um, the Redemption Center, in sure we can. They do a very good job at sorting. They, they sort cans out from brands. Uh, you know which the Coca-Cola's go on one side, the Pepsi goes somewhere else. Like it's very well done. Um, I see them as like an optimal partner in being able to sort different colored glass if it was valuable. Uh, but right now uh, it isn't, or it's just as valuable as, again, metal and plastic. Uh, so what you're saying is invest in incentivizing that they take glass over metal and plastic so and paper. The, the, the New York Association of Counties, for example, has recommended that the bottle bill, uh, instead of being expanded to non-alcoholic beverages, which are generally in plastic and aluminum, be expanded to glass, wine, and liquor bottles. Um, those bottles can be many different colors, clear, green, um, in some cases brown, and I think there's a real potential there to, to take those glass products out of our waste, out of our recycling stream, um, so that the colors can be kept separate. They can be collected through the Redemption Center model, um, which, as you mentioned, is a really effective way of, of keeping products separate. Um, because in order to, in order to make sure that the deposit goes to the right place and comes from the right place, you have to to keep those products um, very separate. All right. So it would make sense to lower the cost on products that we want in the recycling system and, and increase costs on the things that we want out of it. So, uh, so you're pushing this in the state right now, is what you're saying? We're, we're very closely monitoring the, the discussions in the state. There are a lot of folks that are advocating uh, at the state level around this topic, and we're, we're very much involved in those conversations. OK, I guess if I think we should have a conversation about what we, we can do to make sure that we look out for the best interests of the city of New York. And there are a lot of advocates in the canning world that would love to be a part of the conversation as to what it looks like. And we should allow for them to be at the table to do that. Because I wouldn't mind uh, the alcoholic beverage bottles to be worth 25 cents a piece. I guarantee they'll be cleaned out um, and separated appropriately out of your stream. They make money, we make money, um, or, or allow for the right products to be in the stream. I think there's a happy harmony that we could have here that I think would, would go a long way. Um, so I wanna make sure that we allow for canners to be a part of that conversation as well. We, we agree with you entirely, and, and our focus is uh, to make sure that, that whatever happens uh, with the bottle bill at the state level has a really thoughtful dialogue, and all stakeholders, whether they're municipalities, uh, canners, redemption centers, uh, bottlers, whomever, that, that everyone's at the table and, and you know, we're really considering the impacts of whatever decision is made. Thank you. Thank, and you're not worried that we're going to get a bad deal in the state? We're watching it very closely. Okay. All right. Salt. So, uh, we, Council Member Cabrera has walked. We had a huge issue with a lack of salt in November in one uh, snowy incident. Uh, there were many reasons why that happened. So, I'm not saying that there was a lack of salt because we didn't have salt, but more the trucks couldn't move through our communities uh, because the amount of tra traffic that existed. So uh, there is a, uh, how do I say this? Uh, this is just a, let me say a personal experience. So this is not fact. So I'm gonna give you an anecdote. Um, in November, there was no salt. In December, there was extra salt. So I would like to ask, has there been an increase in the amount of salt used by the Department of Sanitation from November, let's say, to December? Has there been an increase? So, and, and I'm sorry, and if, I guess I wanna make sure that if you're using more salt, it's merit-based, not, you're not doing it because a couple of council members were screaming about the amount of snow in November, so you give them more salt in December. I wanna make sure that we stay away from the politics and just do a good job. Okay, so, uh, as a result of that November uh, snowstorm, that event, uh, the department has taken a, a forward-leaning posture in terms of uh, reacting sooner to weather forecasts. 
Uh, unfortunately, the weather forecasts have uh, not been as reliable in terms of how they wind up turning out. Uh, many of the events wound up changing over terrain. Uh, and in the most recent one uh, last week, uh, where we had the potential of up to 10 inches of snow, we actually wound up with uh, six inches. So um, you will actually, yes, you're gonna see our equipment out on the street uh, spreading salt uh, ahead of an event, but in actuality, uh, based on the number of uh, activations that we've had, we've had 17 deployments this year, and in actuality versus last year, it just happens to be a lot of events that unfortunately didn't materialize. Uh, in each event, whenever there is forecast and whenever there is snow in the forecast, we still have a responsibility to spread salt over all 6,500 miles to make sure that the vehicles can get around safely. If in fact the weather doesn't materialize, so be it. So it isn't necessarily uh, a reaction just based on the city council as opposed to we're dealing with the forecasts as they come in. So two questions there. The first one is per what you call incident, I guess. What, what did you call it? Uh, uh, it could be an incident or a deployment. Yeah. It, is there a change in how much salt you're putting out in our streets? No. Trucks are already set in terms of how much salt they, uh, comes out of the back of the truck. Um, same thing with the calcium chloride. That is preset already. So uh, you may see the start of it earlier. But in terms of actually more salt, no. Once uh, we've covered the city or once we feel we're in a comfortable stage within an event, we obviously then change to not spreading full citywide. So the preliminary plan includes $2.1 million to hire four uniform and five civilian staff to enhance snow responses. Uh, you know, I guess in the grand scheme of things, nine employees is supposed to do what to help us with our snow issues? So uh, out of the November event, uh, we did receive confirmation that we could purchase brine trucks for next coming winter. So that, uh, that has gone forward. That is going to be 10 large brine trucks, 14 smaller brine trucks, and 10 additional salt spreaders. So based on the fleet of 34 vehicles, that's why you have five civilians, which are actually mechanics that would be required to maintain them uh, based on the ratio of equipment we have. Uh, with regards to the four uniform individuals, those are going to be individuals who will be dedicated to working out of the JTMC, who will be there for situational awareness and be able to interact with what we're seeing on the traffic cameras and again, direct uh, communication between both headquarters as well as uh, those pieces of equipment that are working in the street. So uh, follow up questions. Uh, is brine more expensive than salt? And why are we considering using brine? Have we ever used it? Just, it's a new, to me it's new, so can we just talk about why you think we should be using this and whether it's a cost saving issue or? So ultimately, uh, brine is basically liquefied salt. Um, by us putting it down ahead of a snow event, we're hoping to uh, suppress the accumulation of snow that does come down so that it doesn't actually bond to the roadway. Um, we don't know yet if when it's all said and done, that saves us from using salt on the back end. But what we've done so far uh, since the November event is we do have a, a handful of small pieces of equipment where we've been testing brine in smaller applications to see if it makes a difference. And so far, we've seen that it's been a positive result. For snow, but what about our streets? What are the environmental effects of using brine over salt? Uh, it is basically liquefied salt, so there's no difference. There's no difference. So it doesn't tear up the roads any faster or any slower? Correct. It, brine is liquid, so it's uh, going through the roads more, I guess, evenly distributed. But you're saying that it has the same effects as rock salt. Um, the brine has the exact same effects? Correct. Okay. All right. We're going to revisit that um, longer term because I, I want to see. Because um, when was brine, for how long has brine existed in our, in, in, how, how long has it ever existed? Is so, it a new product, I guess? Is it a new product that was invented last year? No. So, there so are, why is it cool now and it wasn't cool last year? Uh, over the past couple of years, we've tried multiple products, uh, beet juice, pickle juice. There have been variations of products that we've tried. Is that see, pickle juice? Uh, yeah. Uh, but ultimately, the liquefied 
salt and the brine that we're using uh, we think is compatible with our equipment in terms of our ability to dispense it, store it, and not have a challenge in terms of uh, maintaining it. So uh, again, we've tried various different applications. Um, we've seen other municipalities use it, and we certainly think that uh, it's worth giving it a shot in terms of what the positives can come away from it in terms of being ahead of an event and ultimately potentially using less uh, rock salt then is always there. That's our part of the goal is. Okay, and it's, is it more affordable by, by block, I guess, by, by street mile than rock salt? Um, I do not have the cost comparison for that. Okay, can we see, because if we're gonna eventually move on from rock salt, let's say to brine citywide, we have to know its cost, mm -hmm. uh, how much it costs, so I would like to know that number. And I'm just interested as to why we're doing we're using brine now and we haven't used it in the past, um, because I'm pretty sure it's existed for quite some time. Um, and if it was better, we should have been ahead of the curve on that, not behind it. Um, I guess, uh, okay, I think we're, we're okay. Um, I appreciate your time. Um, uh, appreciate your answers to the questions. I'm looking forward to uh, following up in our next budget hearing on a couple of the concerns that I have. And I just wanna, I guess, reiterate that my concern is we're not doing enough on organics. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like you're getting the support you need to be able to accomplish zero waste. And it doesn't look like we're taking it serious. But it is your plan. And it, it frustrates me that I have to um, ask you what you're doing about your initiative and your plan. Um, and again, I just hope I get better answers about organics the next time around. But I really do appreciate your time. Thank you for answering all of the questions. Um, and thank you. So thank take you. care. Thank you. So the Department of Sanitation portion of the hearing is now over. And in a couple of minutes, we will begin, in nine minutes, we will begin our Business Integrity Commission portion. So thank you all for being here.
Hello, Commissioner. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Yes, it's the afternoon. It's been a busy week. Uh, so, but it's a budget hearing, so we, we can't talk about policy, even though we'll get into some of it. I'm, I'm really grateful you're here. Yes. And uh, just want to thank you for your work. Uh, very happy again, a good week. Uh, we lost Kira Feldman, so that's not a good thing. But her work um, has allowed us to really uh, rethink the way we do work um, in our city related to private sanitation. And I really feel like uh, we're both better for it. And I think uh, BIC is really showing, you know, what we all hoped they would be uh, long term. So I'm, I'm really grateful. So I'm really happy with the work you've done thank recently. You. So I want to thank you for that. And I want you to take it away as you see. Sure. Oh, you're going to get sworn in, though, uh, first. There you go. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Thank you. So <clears throat> good afternoon, Chair Reynoso and member, well, members of your staff uh, of the Solid Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee. I'm Dan Brownell, Commissioner and Chair of the New York City Business Integrity Commission. Um, to my right is First Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel Noah Janelle. And to my left is Assistant Commissioner of Finance and Administration Cindy Haskins. And then behind us are other members of uh, BIC staff, including um, Allison Bonfoy. Um, so, and again, I'm well aware, of course, that you and your staff know about BIC, but I, um, I will begin with some background information about um, our agency. We are both a law enforcement and regulatory agency with a total budget for 2020 of 9.28 million. BIC currently has a total of 79 employees, which includes 11 investigators, 11 attorneys, seven auditors, and eight intelligence analysts. In addition, we work with a squad of detectives from the NYPD's Criminal Enterprise Investigation Section who are physically stationed in BIC's offices. Our investigators and attorneys frequently work with the CEIS detectives of the NYPD on long-term criminal investigations. BIC was created through Local Law 42 of 1996 to regulate the commercial garbage hauling or trade waste industry and rid it of the, from the grip of organized crime and other corruption. The agency was originally known as the Trade Waste Commission, but soon after its creation, the City Council expanded the agency's jurisdiction to include oversight of the public wholesale markets, which include the produce and meat markets, and the new Fulton Fish Market in the Bronx, along with two other meat markets, one in the Meatpacking District in Manhattan and the other in the Sunset Park section of Brooklyn. After the markets were put under our jurisdiction, the agency's name changed to the Business Integrity Commission. We play a unique role in city government and we work to regulate and improve these once troubled industries. In fact, there was no other agency quite like BIC anywhere in the country. Our comprehensive background check process is the central pillar of BIC's oversight. That process consists of thorough investigations into the owners, key employees, and finances of our applicants. We seek to ensure that those companies are not operated by or in any way connected to organized crime or other corrupt influences. After more than two decades of BIC regulation, these industries are now far better than they were. As a result, the agency has continued to evolve over the last several years to address new challenges. Collecting and transporting trade waste, particularly in New York City, is a dangerous and strenuous job. The collection trucks are huge and must share the road with many other motor vehicles along with cyclists and pedestrians. As a result, this administration has made safety in the industry and on city streets a priority. Our jurisdiction over safety in the trade waste industry is limited, but we work within our powers to improve safety on our streets. Since 2016, BIC has been an integral member of the Vision Zero Task Force, which is part of Mayor Bill de Blasio's Vision Zero initiative to end traffic deaths and injuries in New York City. Vision Zero is founded on the, the assertion that every death or serious injury involving a motor vehicle in New York City is one too many. The focus is on protecting the life of everyone who lives in, works in, 
and visits our city. BIC is doing our part to achieve this goal. In the fall of 2018, we passed additional safety-related rules for the trade waste industry. Trade waste companies now must notify BIC of all crashes in which their vehicles are involved and must maintain written policies and procedures regarding compliance with all relevant laws, rules, and regulations of federal, state, and local government authorities. Additionally, the new rules require the companies to increase the minimums on various business-related insurance policies. BIC also continues to promote the Universal Tradeway Safety Manual that was created in 2018, along with some of our partner agencies and members of the trade waste industries, and I would also indicate also the um, organized labor uh, helped us in that uh, project as well. To date, we have distributed hundreds of copies of the manual, which is also available on our website. We are currently working on a second edition of the manual and on inst instructional videos to go along with it. On January 14th of 2019, BIC hosted a workshop on the safety manual termed a Train the Trainers event. A, represent, a, rep a representative of the city's Department of Transportation led the training for managers, drivers, and helpers from numerous trade waste companies to assist them in providing more effective strategies to train their workers in various safety practices and procedures. The event was a great success with approximately 80 attendees. We intend to host a similar events in the future. In addition, BIC has prioritized traffic safety for the trade waste industry, conducting a number of joint enforcement operations with the NYPD, targeting unlawful operation of trade waste trucks. We thank the NYPD for helping us address the problems of speeding, running, and running red lights, and other uh, tr vehicle and traffic law violations by trade waste trucks. Since last summer, the NYPD and BIC have conducted approximately 15 joint operations, which have resulted in the issuance of more than 1,100 NYPD summonses, along with more than 80 BIC administrative violations. The majority of the BIC violations were for undisclosed drivers commingling recyclables with garbage and license plates not properly affixed to the trucks. Perhaps most importantly, 19 unsafe trade waste trucks were put out of service on the spot and towed. BIC looks forward to continuing to work with the NYPD on this initiative. Lastly, with respect to safety, in January 2019, BIC hired a safety data analyst. This is a newly created position at the agency and demonstrates our commitment to safety. Um, this analyst reports directly to the first deputy commissioner and general counsel and is tasked with compiling all safety related data at the agency and helping us make good use of it to improve safety in the trade waste industry. The goal is for BIC to be more proactive in terms of safety, trying to find patterns and trends in the data to help inform our policies. One of BIC's focuses this year is continuing to educate companies on the requirements set forth in Local Law 145 of 2013, which, the New York, which is New York City's vehicle emissions law relating to the trade waste industry. This law requires all heavy duty trade waste vehicles to be equipped with either an EPA certified 2007 or later engine or utilize specific retrofit technology on 2006 or older vehicles. The compliance date is January 1st of 2020. So far, the industry in general has been slow to make the necessary changes to the fleets. Compliance cannot be achieved overnight, particularly for larger companies. BIC has been issuing frequent directives to the industry to provide them with further information and resources regarding the implementation and effects of this law and we are working closely with DEP to organize a resource fair to connect companies with the various vendors that provide retrofits. But the bottom line is that time is growing short and it is the company's responsibility to comply with the vehicle emissions law. BIC is empowered to deny license and registration applications for failure to comply with that law 
and BIC will use its authority to take a strong stand against companies that flout this important environmental initiative. BIC has begun issuing administrative violations to companies that have not provided vehicle information to BIC as directed. Organized unions have been a key partner in improving safety in the trade waste industry. Understanding the needs of workers in the industry, their jobs, and the challenges they face is essential to making the industry and the city as a whole safer. Last month, I testified in front of this committee in favor of three bills relating to unions. I am pleased that on February 28th, the City Council passed them. We have a strong relationship with a number of other agencies that enforce labor laws and have been speaking to them about this new legislation. We will continue to collaborate with them and hopefully establish new relationships with other agencies to help empower workers in the trade waste industry. Additionally, we are working with the Department of Consumer and, and Worker Protection as we develop a Workers' Bill of Rights for the trade waste industry. The PMMR is a measure of BIC's accomplishments, efforts, and goals in carrying out our law enforcement and regulatory duties, preserving a competitive and fair environment in the industries we oversee. BICS fulfills its mandate through, ver through vigorous background investigations, criminal and administrative investigations, and the development and enforcement of our regulations. With respect to administrative violation, BIC issued significantly more violations to our licensed and regis registered trade waste companies this fiscal year compared to the same four-month period last fiscal year. This increase is primarily due to trade waste companies failing to comply with commission directives, such as providing BIC with vehicle data as it relates to the vehicle emissions law. Regarding enforcement in the city's public wholesale markets, the number of violations issued remains consistent with the same four-month period a year ago. BIC issued 22 violations in 2018 compared to 23 violations during the same period of 2019. While improving the efficiency in the application process continues, BIC must maintain its high standard of background review and investigation for all of our applicants. These investigations are dynamic, depending on the available intelligence, and some can become quite complex and lengthy. That being said, BIC strives for balance between the competing goals of a thorough background investigation process and improved productivity. Approval time on market applications has improved overall. The average age of a pending market application has decreased by 31%. The average time to approve such an application has decreased by 45%. Due in part to the high renewal application cycle for trade waste application for applicants, the number of pending trade waste hauling applications has increased by 41% in the first four months of fiscal year 2019 compared to the same period of fiscal 2018. The average time to approve a trade waste renewal application has increased by 19%. In addition to the renewal cycle, there were also a number of investigations and other projects that required increased attention from BIC staff, including attorneys, investigators, and auditors. Those matters took staff time away from processing applications. Despite these challenges, because we prioritize reviewing new trade waste applications as opposed to renewals, the average time to approve a new trade waste hauling application has remained steady. This is, an, this is important because new applicants cannot operate unless their applications are approved, while companies submitting renewal applications can continue to operate while their applications are under review. In conclusion, this summarizes our recent work because looking forward to the challenges of the year ahead, including continuing to improve safety in the trade waste industry and ensure compliance with the vehicle emissions law. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. In your testimony, I just wanted, I guess, to uh, another policy question and wanted some of you could help me just clarify uh, what our goal is. With the 15 joint operations, 
uh, which resulted in 1,100 summonses and over uh, 80 BIC administrative violations. My concern has always been that these businesses force their drivers uh, to operate under you know, terrible circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they do that and the NYPD stops them, uh, the ticket goes to the driver. And this driver that makes very little money and um, is, you know, is held accountable by bosses trying to ensure the bottom line, um, I just get concerned we're going after the wrong people. Uh, can we just have a, I guess, uh, you know, how you, how you feel policy-wise about um, how, on who we should be going after, I guess. Uh, and my concern that I'm not necessarily proud of the 1,100 summonses that are going to these drivers that I think are, you know, are going there forcefully. Or, like, they're not, they're not, you know, I guess th their trucks don't have a license plate. It's not their truck. It's the business's mm -hmm. truck and so forth. But they're being held accountable for the ills of their bosses. So I just want to have a conversation with you about what you think about that policy. So why don't I let Noah is the one that actually oversees that, and then I'll probably well, have no, something. Because no. I definitely have a, a, a view on this. Yeah, yeah. So first, with respect to the administrative violations that BIC issues, those go to the company. Uh, and so, and then with respect to the summonses, uh, it is true that the summonses are going to the drivers, but for example, if you're running a red light, I understand that um, some of them work very densely populated routes and they're rushing to get uh, to, from stop to stop, but in the end, you're driving uh, a, what can be a very dangerous vehicle on very crowded streets. And uh, so things like running a red light and other VTL, vehicle and traffic law violations, are very serious. And so that's why we've paired with the NYPD to uh, try and increase the enforcement on that because as the commissioner uh, said, we have 11 total investigators and so we need uh, it's very helpful to pair with the NYPD to do those that kind of enforcement. So, so while I don't disagree with you that running a red light is running a red light and we have to enforce it, uh, I'd say if, let's say you give, just like any driver, you give them 10 points on a license. If you give a business 10 points and say if your driver runs a red light, you lose a point. Guarantee the routes will change, there will be less people rushing, 1,400 stops won't be a thing of the norm, or you will build in systems uh, by which a, a, a owner would encourage good behavior. This happens in TLC. Uh, TLC holds the bases accountable for any violations that the drivers uh, uh, ac accumulate so that uh, if you have five bad drivers that you get held accountable as a base, um, not only the driver. Uh, and this helps change behavior because then those bases either fire their drivers or uh, tell the drivers that they need to improve. Um, and then the violations go down. Now, do we have, I see, and then the administrative violations, uh, are they independent of the drivers or the, the situation that happened with the drivers? Or for example, if you found a driver that has, that ran a red light, are the big administrative violations tied to it? And I guess for budgeting reasons is the reason why I would ask this for budget. I just wanna know how much resources you're spending on going after drivers as opposed to the businesses and how how that's shared. So the administrative violations are issued at the time of the s traffic stop, but they are separate from the reason for the traffic stop. So for example, if it's commingling, which uh, you know, it was, has, been a has been a focus of ours over the last couple of years, uh, if they're stopped, for example, running a red light or some other reason, if the NYPD stop them, our, invest, our investigators are looking for something different. And so if we see commingled recyclables with putrescible garbage in the back of the truck, that's the kind of thing that they're being issued by our investigators. Okay, so I'm gonna be looking at a legislative change. I think that of course with way zoning, a lot of this stuff um, becomes a moot point or it's not necessarily uh, important, um, as important. But for right now, while we're having this conversation, I wanna make sure that we hold the businesses accountable um, who I think are putting the drivers through this situation. And remember, the, the drivers are not getting paid anything and they have to pay these fines. Um, it, it hurts their bottom line. And uh, the people that are not being affected, again, are, are the businesses. I just want to make sure that we put the, 
put it in, in its perspective and balance. And if it shouldn't be equal, uh, the businesses should be uh, being held more accountable than the, the drivers. Right, now, if so you have a bad driver, the businesses can regulate and fix that. But um, if a bad driver has a bad, if a driver has a bad employer, uh, there's very little that person can do uh, out of job security. So if I can just chime in a little, yeah. um, I think the responsibility has to be both with both the companies and the drivers. First of all, you don't have to convince me that there are far too many companies in this industry that basic that essentially work their drivers and helpers into the ground. We just had one, of course, that occupied a good bit of the summer and fall who is thankfully no longer in oper operation. Um, so again, you don't have to, and that I hope is the extreme example in this industry, but there are other companies that um, do that far to excess. That having been said, it's the driver who's the one behind the wheel and we have to hold the drivers responsible as well when they do dangerous things like run lights, speed, go the wrong way on one-way streets. You've seen some, I'm sure you've seen some of the footage. I think, what is it, Inside Edition just had some fairly horrifying videos that look like, you know, Sixth Avenue in Midtown in a, in a garbage truck going literally from one side of the street, you know, crossing five or six lanes to the other side. I mean, that is just crazy. So, as I said, I think both have to be addressed in terms of the responsibility. And hopefully soon with the, with the commercial waste zone bill, the, the, what we're calling the safety bills will be considered. One really enables us to hold the, the companies much more liable because we can create many more um, rules with regard to safety. For me, the thing that I've learned, you know, to, to, to a large extent with the help of, of, or, of good organized labor who sat down with us, if we look at the one st statistic alone, which is the length of time they have their drivers out on the road, for me, that tells me everything I need to know about the way that company operates. Because if they're excessive, then I'm, they're, they're basically screwing their workers every other way that they can in addition to having them out on the road too long. And then the other part of that bill, which I know is a little bit of the touchy part, which, which, where we would um, license drivers, I think that's also critical. We do it in TLC, and we do it in another industry which is really screwed up, which is the tow truck industry. And so I think both of those are really critical, but as you've indicated, and I certainly agree with you, that it's a balance between the companies and what, you know, how long the routes are that they have to do and what and how much time they have to do it and of course the drivers that are actually behind the wheel. Yeah, it's been, uh, the power dynamic has been so one-sided that while I get that we need to make sure everyone is, is held accountable, um, we really need to rein, out, rein, that, rein in these companies uh, and I guess we're taking it one step at a time, and then after so that we'll have another if conversation. I can, so this is, the, I think, one of the challenges for you and I, or us and you guys, is we've got to figure out a way, and we, there are some federal preemption issues that are, that are a little tricky, to mandate or put a cap on the number of hours that drivers can be out on a shift and the number of hours that they can be out on a week. If we can get that to a manageable amount, and of course we'll want to have um, DSNY's good counsel on what they do you know, for their agency, I think that's going to go a long way to improving safety. I agree 100%. I think we've had that conversation offline a, a couple of times, but I agree. I wish we had more control as to how, how many hours uh, a vehicle operator is exactly. allowed to, 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 to operate. So I, we are on the same page there. I'm looking forward to working together to try to figure that out. Um, so you have a budgeted headcount of 93 personnel, um, but what we see is an actual headcount of 79. But they say you're budgeted for 93. Can, I, my big concern there is that given the pegs that the mayor is proposing here, what ends up happening is that they go after the agencies that didn't fill in their headcount. Um, and even though you might have a need there, um, they cut you off because it's easier to not uh, to to cut what you don't have than it is to cut agencies that do have something. So I just want to know where you're at with that and want to make sure I protect your headcount. So I'll let Ms. Haskins start and then I'll probably chime in after that. Uh, well, as you said, it is a, uh, we are working with OMB. It is a new budget reality and um, 
you know, we're making difficult choices and we're doing what we can with what we have right now. So, so am I right that you have a headcount, um, an actual headcount, a budget headcount for 2019 of 93? Uh, 92 plus one uh, federal line. But your actual headcount right now is 79. That's correct. Is it an issue with hiring? Like, what, why is it that we can't get to the 92 plus one? Uh, the, once the freeze was put in place, we're at 79, and we're working with OMB to see what we can do. So there was a so, <laughs> so there was a freeze put in place where you can't even increase your 79, and now there's going to be a peg that puts it so that that might that 93 headcount might be eliminated. Um, that's concerning. I want to have a a conversation with OMB when they when they return about that. Um, it puts you at a at a huge disadvantage here. Uh, especially when I'm asking you to do a lot. Uh, I think the public is asking you to do a lot, and we're not matching uh, that level of responsibility and urgency with a uh, headcount that's appropriate so that you can do your job. So we're paying attention to that. I didn't know it was because of the freeze. I just thought you were having trouble hiring people or finding good people, uh, but that's not the case. You've been, your hands are tied behind your back. You don't need to say much. I, I got it, Commissioner. Um, we do have here, uh, the preliminary plan includes 195,000 uh, in fiscal year 2019, going to 298,000 in 2023, to hire four safety enforcement personnel to work with INBIC's investigative unit. Um, what was your original ask to OMB uh, to fill these positions and how much did you actually get? So I, I wanna know what it looks like internally when you're negotiating with OMB. Um, was it more than four that you asked for? It was, it was 21. Okay, so you asked for 21 and you get four. We did have a lot of conversations from the 21 to the four. Uh, we were asked to prioritize them. I prioritized the people. Uh, ultimately, we did get two investigators, a safety data analyst and a programmer, and we did hire three of those people already. So I, I, I fortunately um, passed intro 1329 in the city council and it's probably going to be signed by the mayor. Uh, my concern now with your hiring freeze and the potential pegs is that this new responsibility of having to investigate uh, union uh, union officials or union, uh, I'm sorry, yeah. union officers, yeah. right? Um, you're gonna need more people to do that job. I'm giving you more responsibility. And now I'm concerned that you might not be able to um, fulfill your responsibility because of a lack of employees. How much, how much, how many new personnel do you think you need uh, to, to fulfill the responsibilities of intro 1329? We are working with OMB on that. We've already had conversations with them, but it's preliminary and um, we'll, you know, whatever we do, we're gonna make it work. So we'll yeah. just continue to talk with them. We've got some time before 1329 is uh, um, enacted. I don't know if that's the right word, but we have been talking to OMB about it, so. All right, I fumble words all the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so given your previous negotiations from like, let's say an example of 20 to four, 20 employees to four employees, again, I'm concerned that you're gonna get, uh, you know, your hands are gonna be tied behind your back again when I want you to do your job on a legislation that I passed. And I'm gonna, again, be holding hearings, holding you accountable for how you're doing this job, and right, you know you didn't give me a number about how many, uh, regarding how many people you think would be necessary to do this job, but you said you're gonna negotiate with OMB. I feel like OMB has a, uh, a level of disconnect with exactly the type of work you're doing. Um, and while they're looking at numbers, they're not, you know, it's hard to, I guess overall I'm just concerned that you guys don't have the personnel to do the job that you're supposed to be doing. Well, I know that when we knew this was going to pass, I did send them some information. They reviewed the legislation. They've come back with a lot of questions. Uh, we started responding to them, um, and that's as where it is right now. So in, when we had conversations initially with OMB related to the legislation, independent of our conversations with BIC, they said that they would probably take five to 10 employees to do this work. Um, and 
just want you to, well, I'm hoping that when they get back to us, uh, that we see something close to five to 10. But this freeze and this, uh, this peg is really putting us in a position where we might, again, see a reduction in services uh, and the work that you're doing. Uh, and it's extremely concerning. But this is more questions for OMB um, because you have no say in that, obviously. You get to negotiate as best you can, but ultimately uh, they, they're the decision maker. We have a violations issue. Council Member, if I can just, yeah, so absolutely. I did have a meeting um, with the deputy mayor that I report to earlier this week and um, also with OMB, I remind you, I think we have like, a, what is it, 120 days before the law goes into effect. So I know, and I've been um, guaranteed by OMB and City Hall that we will be sitting down to have conversations about how we're gonna do this. And I have to tell you that in my experience in four and a half years, that we've had a very good working relationship with OMB in terms of listening. We don't, we don't necessarily get everything we want, but I think they listen and they do their best to give us what we need. And I anticipate that's gonna happen here. Okay. Well, I'm gonna do my part. There's a, a lot of talk about how this administration cares deeply about the workers in the private sanitation industry. Um, and this is them putting their money where their mouth is. They can right. say a lot of things. If they're not supporting you through staff, then do they really care? Right. So I'm going to make sure that I hold them accountable through that. Um, so, so while I appreciate your relationship with OMB, I think I, I'm going to be publicly doing my part so you can get as much as you possibly can. No, that's can. fine. And just so you know, we've already had some conversations with both federal labor IGs and other investigators and also with the state's attorney general. And so in our general plan going forward, that as much as possible, I want BIC investigators to the, be the ones that are going to be interacting directly with the workers because first of all, we understand the industry better than anybody else. Right, right. And whenever we talk to a worker about one particular issue or problem, we always find out there are more. Yeah, yeah, and as I yeah. said, we're the ones to best appreciate what to do that. And the other thing that I wanna thank you for, mm -hmm. and I'm not gonna name mm -hmm. the local number, but okay. you connected us up with a local that I had never spoken to with. We had a great meeting two weeks ago. We're having another meeting next week with some other federal law enforcement people, and I think there are a number of investigations we're gonna be able to initiate. Right. I'm, glad, I'm glad I could be helpful. A lot of folks come to me, and I'm happy to connect them to you, but uh, you've had a very strong and improved relationship with a lot of the locals that I deal with yeah. that I think is important. We can all work better if we're all on the same page trying to root out this corruption and the crime that we think is happening. Yeah, so that keep that happen. coming, we appreciate it. Okay, and then so the violations issued to legally operated private waste haulers has gone from 34 to 121 in the form of actual from FY18 to FY19. Is this related to these things, these operations um, with NYPD? I th um, but why? Some of them are also, we, because of local law 145 and other things that we've had a number of commission directives where companies have to provide us with certain data. First of all, with regard to local law 145, if we don't know what the, what the state of play is with regard to trucks currently on the road, we can't hope to be able to effectively regulate it and be in compliance with the law. Um, so it's been, um, and in some ways, the response by some companies, too many as far as I'm concerned, has been abysmal that we've issued them a number of violations. There's no excuse why they can't respond to us, especially after we give them several chances to do so. So that's, that's actually, I like to see an increase when it comes to that um, because it, you know, I don't necessarily think compliance is improving. I just think that uh, when I see the numbers go down, I actually just think that we're doing less when it comes to oversight. Right. So if you're doing, if the numbers are increased for, for increasing, for me, I feel like we're doing the work. Um, with respect to PMMR reporting, would we have, um, I guess I wanna know where your investigators are or, um, where inspections are conducted of private carters. Um, I don't want it, uh, here is, is asking um, for it to be disaggregated by borough, but it depends on where these sanitation uh, companies are. Uh, but I guess I just wanna know where these investigations and our inspections are being conducted. Well, um, we, we wouldn't really do inspections on our own. We really don't have inspectors, they're investigators, but we work often with federal motor carry people, obviously with the PD, and NOAA's been, you know, initiated that particular relationship. And, and so, and for us, you know, one of the big priorities is gonna be unlicensed activity, and we haven't really gotten to 145 yet, 
But um, with regard to the hardship waiver, which the deadline to submit those to us was at the end of December, we got very few. It's, it's really not an issue. But there's a big issue, and the big issue is we still have far too many trucks, and I think I indicated in my written testimony, that are not in compliance. So what I don't know is companies just aren't going to bother submitting a waiver, and then they plan to lose their license and operate without a license. I'm not sure what it is, but I can tell you that I have a huge concern that come January 1st of 2020, we're still going to have hundreds and hundreds of trucks that are improperly on the road in violation of Local Law 145. So we're starting to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Uh, that's very telling. Uh, um, we should talk more about that. I mean, we don't have a lot of applications, even though we know a lot of trucks have been converted or are exactly. up to date. So I would love to maybe have a hearing or do something to bring attention well, let to us this. Get, let us gather more data so that we can have a more useful hearing. But it, right now, it, it doesn't look good. Yeah, and then my concern becomes, do we have the capacity through the folks that are doing the conversions and are uh, um, abiding by local law 145 to take on the businesses of those that are not? Um, so then it, it, is, it gets even more complicated. We right. might see an extreme reduction in the companies doing this work in the city of New York um, even before we get to way zoning. So, exactly. Um, yep, um, I always expected that. Um, but I'm actually done with my questioning, Commissioner. I really appreciate your time. I'm very concerned about your headcount uh, and it, again, the peg and the the hiring freeze, right? Uh, and the demands on you uh, are forever, ever increasing, um, and it doesn't seem like your your headcount is matching that. Um, but again, I appreciate you protecting workers and protecting the public. Uh, so I'm very happy with the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for your time. And the only other thing I would say, and I'm glad you didn't ask about it, there have been some things in the news the last couple weeks about some companies. It's not something that I would want to testify to in open investigations, but as always, I'm happy to come over and sit down with you and provide you with information in terms of, that I can in terms of what's going on. Look, there's always opportunities for growth, but that, that uh, I guess, investigation um, is, is a breath of fresh air that, you know, that this is not a one-off, that we might need to do a lot more work here. Yep. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's why I'm, you know, I'm pleased and I'm looking forward to how that investigation unfolds. But thank you for your work. So much. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to have our public testimony portion of it. Uh, we have Jacqueline Atman, Adriana Espinoza, Eric Goldstein, and Melissa Ieshan. Is there someone missing? Oh, yes. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. This is like the, the Captain Planet uh, panel here. Um, so please, in, in any way that you want to start, uh, from left to right, um, we can go ahead. We can start on this side, yeah. Uh, we're not going to put a, put a clock up, um, but if you guys get out of hand, <laughs> we'll turn it on, OK? Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso. My name is Jackie Ottman, and I'm the chair of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board, the Manhattan SWAB. The Brooklyn SWAB and the Queen SWAB Organizing Committee have also co-signed our testimony. I'm attaching to our testimony a copy of a letter that the Manhattan SWAB is sending to the mayor today, underscoring our request for continued support and expansion of the organics curbside collection 
program, something that we believe is essential to achieving our zero waste as well as climate goals. I am specifically testifying today to ask the City Council to support the full funding of DSNY's fiscal 20 budget request of $55 million for waste prevention, reuse, and recycling, and in particular to underscore our support for an incremental $2.5 million request for mass education and outreach efforts to bolster citizens' participation in recycling and other waste prevention activities. Here's why we believe a bolstered campaign is necessary. The Mayor's 1NYC plan introduced in 2015 called for increasing the diversion rates of mandatory residential recyclables like metal, glass, plastics, and paper and cardboard through a number of measures including introducing financial incentives, shifting to single stream collection, creating zero waste schools, and requiring collection in commercial offices. It also included new voluntary programs to make it easy for residents to divert a host of other recyclable items from the waste stream, clothing and textiles, electronics, and organics among them. Much to our disappointment, some of these initiatives have failed to be implemented, and the residential diversion rate upticked only slightly to 20%, while a full 77% of the waste stream is recyclable. Your chart earlier illustrated this gap. This level of recycling is not sustainable. It's not in line with the city's environmental and climate goals, and it puts the city at finan significant financial risk given that we must export our waste at great cost. Clearly, something new and bold needs to be done to help ensure that we achieve the city's goal of zero waste to landfill by 2030. A $2.5 million increment to our public education and outreach efforts can help fit this bill. Recycling infrastructure and enforcement efforts alone cannot guarantee active compliance and participation in the city's recycling programs. New York's 8.6 million residents must be motivated to adopt the day in and day out habit of recycling and take other steps to reduce their waste. A massive education and outreach campaign can help make reduce, reuse, and recycle the core value within our city's consumption culture necessary to reach our goal. Planning for such a campaign must begin with an updated understanding of what New Yorkers know and feel about the city's recycling program. No large market no large-scale market research to track New Yorkers' recycling-related awareness, attitudes, understanding, and habits has been conducted since 2005. In a city as transient as New York, awareness of the need to recycle, supplemented by the knowledge of what, where, and how to recycle, must be constantly cultivated. To enforce a day and daily habit, reminders to recycle must be constant and ever-present in the media and in the public spaces, transit stations, workplaces, schools, and other places where most New Yorkers can be reached. Furthermore, much has changed since 2005. Many more items are now being collected for recycling. This includes a full range of plastics, plastic bags and film in supermarkets or New York State law, as well as the aforementioned clothing, electronics, and organics. Meanwhile, a new generation of recyclers has grown up without the social force of a public campaign about why and how to recycle, and as a result of the 1NYC plan, 400,000 NYCHA residents now have access to recycling, but very little relevant education. Also, attitudes have changed within the population at large, further underscoring the need for compelling messaging. Skepticism now runs high among Americans, particularly among millennials, our largest generation and future leaders, that whatever is collected for recycling will actually be recycled into new materials. This is what Councilman Espinoza referred to earlier. As depicted in the chart developed by members of our Residential Recycling Committee that I am including with our testimony, the Department of Sanitation's 2017 Waste Characterization Study revealed that 71% of what's winding up in the trash, the residue after recyclables are diverted from the waste stream, is fully recyclable within the city. This suggests high levels of confusion about what exactly can be collected. 
Clearly, education is critical to imparting an appreciation for the need to recycle and its appropriate role within the waste management, reduce, reuse, and recycle hierarchy. There's hope. We here in New York City are blessed to be the home of the world's leading community of marketing, communications, media, and outreach experts. This community possesses in abundance the expertise necessary to develop a compelling communications program for a fraction of the $412 million requested allocation for fiscal 2020 to export our waste. Our advertising and media community is capable of tapping into New Yorkers' pride and beliefs that theirs is the greatest city in the world. The long-running I Love New York campaign is just one example. The creativity and environmental passions of today's millennials can be enlisted to create cost-effective viral videos, hashtags, images, and more that can make the daily and sometimes unseemly aspects of sorting our waste cool. An effective campaign can start by convening a high-level zero-waste education and outreach advisory board composed of senior, active, and retired executives of major communications firms. The SWAB stands ready to assist with creation of such a board, as well as provide additional ideas and support for a much-needed education and outreach effort on behalf of zero waste. Thanks for your time to submit this testimony today. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. I'm going to allow for everyone to make their statement, and then we'll have a conversation, and we'll talk Great. it up a little bit. But thank you for your testimony. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Eric Goldstein from the Natural Resources Defense Council. With your handwritten testimony. That's correct, okay. which I will summarize in oh. view of the hour. Melissa, you're rubbing off on Melissa as well now. Look at you. <laughs> Uh, first, we're pleased to hear of the continuing progress in the implementation and funding of the city's proposed commercial waste zoning proposal. Indeed, NRDC and our partners, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, the Teamsters, Nilby and Align believe that implementation of an exclusive commercial waste zoning plan represents the most single most so important solid waste reform to be implemented by this city since the adoption of the curbside recycling program 30 years ago. We thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this issue and look forward to working with you to enact such a plan in the weeks and months ahead. Our joy about the progress on commercial waste zoning is tempered, however, by the administration's latest in a continuing series of disappointments on the issue of organics handling. Simply stated, the city's FY 2020 preliminary budget, by once again failing to fund the continued expansion of curbside organics collection, has placed the city's entire zero waste strategy on the critical list. Organics represents the single largest portion of the municipal waste stream, as you know, over 30%. Mayor de Blasio's number one initiative in his zero waste strategy set forth in the one NYC plan was to, quote, expand New York City organics program to serve all New Yorkers by the end of 2018. Breaking this promise in 2018, and failing to fund continued expansion of curbside organics in the proposed budget represents nothing less than an unraveling of the mayor's zero waste commitment and a significant blot on the administration's overall sustainability record. And we hold City Hall, not the Department of Sanitation, responsible for this situation. So we urge you and your council colleagues to seek to restore funding for curbside organics expansion as the budget negotiations unfold in the weeks to come. It's hard to see a more important environmental priority in the current budget process. Finally, we're concerned about the economics of the city's residential recycling program. As you know, municipal recycling operations around the nation received a jolt last year when China effectively closed its doors to receiving recyclables from the United States. But even that is not as threatening to the economic viability of New York City's curbside recycling program as the well-intended but ill-conceived state budget proposal to expand the bottle bill by adding a five-cent deposit on non-alcoholic beverages such as sports drinks and ready-to-drink coffees and teas. This state legislation would remove millions of these containers from the city's residential waste stream every year. But these containers are made from PET, HDPE, that's plastics one and two, and aluminum, for which strong markets exist. $800 a ton for HDPE, for example. We've long supported bottle bill legislation in New York and around the country to jumpstart recycling programs. And we would support an expanded bottle bill with even a 20 or 25% deposit 
for wine and liquor bottles because these containers are 99% glass, which is problematic for curbside recycling programs. But to enact state legislation that would deprive municipal recycling programs of valuable PET, HDPE, and aluminum is simply nuts unless your goal is to erode the economic foundation of curbside municipal recycling. New York City should be leading the charge against this legislation. And at the present time, your leadership and that of your council colleagues is more important than ever. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Eric. Yes. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I will be brief. My name is Melissa Yashan. I am a senior staff attorney at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and NOPI is one of the founding members of the Transform Don't Trash Coalition, which Eric mentioned the members of. We are a coalition of environmental justice, environmental community, and labor organizations working together to try and transform the way commercial waste is processed in the city of New York. Today, um, I'm here to thank the Department of Sanitation for their thoughtful stakeholder process that they invested in over two years and thank the council for supporting that process, which led to the detailed commercial waste zone implementation plan that they released in November of 2018. We look forward to robust budgetary support for the first phase of implementation of transformative commercial waste policy and the continued opportunity to work together collaboratively with the council and the administration to ensure that the zone system in transition phase works smoothly and embodies the equity and sustainability goals our coalition shares with you, council member, and the administration. Finally, we are thrilled that the final marine transfer station is set to open later this month and cheer the Department of Sanitation's efforts to finally turn the swamp's goals into reality. With the MTSs all fully operational, we look forward to working together to think about ways to incorporate these state-of-the-art facilities into the city's commercial waste processing system and urge the council to think about creative budgetary ideas to address or even incentivize this, which would bring us even closer to true environmental justice as a city. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Anna? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCB represents over 31,000 members in New York City, and we're committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Reynoso um, for the opportunity to testify here today and to be on the Captain Planet panel, as he called it. Um, NYLCB supports the passage of a city budget in fiscal year 2020 that secures progress on many of the environmental, transportation, and public health priorities of Mayor Bill de Blasio that he's called for in 1NYC and beyond. Our city is staring down a crisis of existential importance, and it is incumbent upon our elected leaders to invest our tax dollars in climate action and climate solutions. The Department of Sanitation's preliminary uh, fiscal year 20 budget invests heavily in personnel, exporting waste, and general administration. However, only a fraction of the department's preliminary budget, 55 million or about 3.1%, is dedicated to waste prevention, reuse, and recycling. This number represents a 9% de decrease from the fiscal year 19 adopted budget and is in stark contrast with the 23% of the budget being used to export our waste. Moreover, these figures are inconsistent with the city's stated goal of zero waste to landfills by 2030. In fiscal year 19, the total curbside um, and containerized recycling diversion rate um, was 17.6, or as Disney just um, testified today, 20.9, which is great, um, which is a between two and five percent increase from uh, fiscal year 14. If we continue at this pace, uh, diversion citywide will be um, adjusted now based on this 20.9 percent is 32 percent in 2030. Um, that's very far from the 90 percent goal. Uh, DSNY's waste prevention budget must reflect a more aggressive attempt to achieve the zero by 30 goal. Reaching the city's zero waste goal will require work from all New Yorkers, cooperation of city officials, private industry, and buy-in from the general public. If we are to reach our goal of zero waste, um, NYLCV believes the city should invest $10 million in public engagement around the organic waste and recycling programs available to residents. It is imperative that New Yorkers know not only the options available to them, but also the environmental significance of participation. Current marketing for Vision Zero, a goal which has the focus and budget indicative of a serious policy priority, 
should, should serve as a template. This outreach should inform New Yorkers of the programs available and teach them how to properly sort recyclables and organics, but focusing on the what and how is not enough. The campaign should explain why these changes are necessary and make the direct connection to climate change and the city's sustainability goals. In addition to traditional marketing, the city should expand its targeted outreach. In particular, maintenance staff in large buildings should be seen as key ambassadors to the zero waste goals. Sustainability training for this sector could have an exponential impact on diversion rates. And finally, child and youth engagement is key. The earlier we can instill the importance of eco-friendly behaviors, the more likely they are to carry it into adulthood. The city should continue to expand its educational programs in schools and encourage better source separation in cafeterias, particularly of organic waste. Diverting organic waste from la landfills is perhaps the most critical component of zero by 30, as organics represents 31% of the residential waste stream. Further, when this waste ends up in, in landfills, it releases significant quantities of methane as it decomposes. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It absorbs heat from the sun at 32 times the rate of carbon dioxide, trapping that heat in our atmosphere and contributing significantly to global warming. Unfortunately, instead of growing the residential organics program to keep more of this waste from landfills, uh, last year DSNY paused their expansion and to date, well, I guess today we have an answer, um, to date, advocates have not been told when the program will, will resume. Before the expansion was paused, New York City's organics program was already the largest of its kind in the country. We recognize the complexity in sustaining and growing a program of this size. However, if zero waste is truly a goal of this administration, the budget figure should re reflect an investment significant enough, enough to bring the organics program to scale citywide and stimulate the demand in the market for regional processing capacity of this waste. I'd like to again thank Chair Reynoso and the Committee on Sanitation uh, for the opportunity to testify and for your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, a, lot, a lot said in all, all four testimonies, so I'm gonna try to go through it and we should just have a conversation more than anything else. Um, so uh, we mentioned um, the media and outreach concern uh, and uh, in a city where we can be so creative and we can get this message across, why is it that we're falling short? Uh, I, I personally think it's a, it's a culture within the Department of Sanitation. They do something one way, and that's the only way they know how to do it. It's a, uh, we need to bring about creative, creative minds um, in there. But I did ask for an increase actually to 2.5 million. I found out that their budget is 2.5 million right now. I think we should double it. But I also did research and we found out that the budget for Vision Zero was actually not 10 million, but it was 2.5 million. So I think this would, this is relative to another campaign that the city is aggressively moving forward with. But um, the 2.5 million for Vision Zero is exclusively just for Vision Zero. Um, so maybe we should have an exclusive budget for zero waste. And that's why I asked for the 2.5 million for the outreach. So I just want to respond to that, um, mainly because Jackie, you asked, you, you were obviously thinking creatively about the, the media and outreach and how we do that with hashtags and, and so forth. And, um, how we've fallen short. The bottle bill, um, Eric, I really want you to stay. I, after this, we have a panel of candidates that are gonna be talking about uh, the bottle bill, probably gonna be talking about the bottle bill. I would like for you to stay to hear them out as well. And I wanna talk about um, our coalition, uh, you know, maybe expanding or having a conversation about how we work together to figure this solution out. Because I agree with you, what we need to do is encourage for folks to take the things we don't want out of the recycling stream. And the way we do that is that we put a high price tag on it. Um, and the things that we do want in the recycling stream, we keep inside. It'll help us in many ways because the city would have would s stop subsidizing SIMS at such a high rate if they were getting the products that they want, let's say, but also allow for the counters to assist us in removing the things we don't want out of it and, and sort it more appropriately. So that's what I think is the best thing to do, but I'm excited to hear from them to get their take on what they think is, is best. And we should be listening to the folks that do that every day. So um, I appreciate your concern and I have the same concern on the bottom bill. You saw that the city seems to be paying attention, but um, hasn't really asked us to get too involved yet. And that concerns me uh, because it'll, it'll pass tomorrow and we've never got involved. Um, then just uh, the commercial waste uh, for DSNY. So we have this, uh, we have the 
way zoning that we're hoping comes about soon. And I want to see how that plays out. When I'm, my only fear is just the city continuing to subsidize for a lot of the work that we're doing here when it comes to trash uh, in the city. And that if they come into a city-based facility, it's, it's going to cost. So we just want to have that conversation more intently. Uh, but also just want to wait for the way zoning to happen before we like really talk about starting diverting some trash from from private carding from private carding to, to the city. You disagree. Well, it's a conversation, so you're all gonna open it up and we can have that conversation. And then the reuse recycle. So the reason they dropped the budget, they're saying, is because they stopped buying organic bins and the organic bin, bins in, in procurement were the five million dollars that they spent. They're not buying more bins, so they don't need the money. But it doesn't mean we can't keep the money inside that that uh with that line item and use it for something else. Uh, it's not like it's a ton of money. I think it's like 55 million, uh, right? 55 million, now we have 50 million. Um, we're not supposed to be going down in that area. It should be going up and we should be looking to reduce budget, uh, um, reduce the budget in other locations where we think it doesn't serve the purpose of reaching zero waste. So even if they have a justification for why the money is gone or why they don't need to spend the money the same way, we should have still fought to make sure it stays in that category or that line item so that we could push the items that we think are valuable to actually achieving zero waste. So that's like my assessment of all your testimonies, but there's just snippets of it. I know it was a lot more um, comprehensive than that, but just uh, wanted to let you know I'm listening and we could talk. Yeah. Um, uh, Mike, yes. You make great points. So just to be clarified, the DSNY's outreach, bu outreach budget is $250,000, not $2.5 million. So just to put it in perspective, I said 2.5 and I was doubling it. No, it's uh, increasing by what, 10 times um, the way we're looking at it to 2.5. So obviously we think that they're falling short on that. But the commissioner did say, two, he said 2.5 million. So in the next budget, I'll clarify. We needed these numbers to be more, more clear. Yeah. It was more. All right. Yeah, there. So it's the entire budget is two point five million, of which two hundred and fifty is used for waste for for zero waste. Um, so they're using ten percent of their budget for zero waste. So that's that's the clarification. So go ahead. Yeah, just to uh, respond to uh, one thing. Chairman, uh, when you mentioned that this isn't in the Department of Sanitation and Culture, of course, the Department of Sanitation is a logistics agency. They know how to move things from one place to another and do that well and efficiently. However, that uh, they have the ability in the past to do a very memorable campaign. All of us who are you know, over 40 years old remember the dueling blue and green bin recycling campaign that's embedded in our brains. I'm younger than 40 and I remember it, so I want yeah. to be clear. I remember yeah. the so, dueling bins. And that came straight out of the Department of Sanitation. It was run by Bob Lang, who was the chairman of the head of the recycling division. So they do have that capability and they can get it again with staffing with the right people. It's also the reason why I mentioned in my testimony starting a zero waste outreach and education board just by recruiting, just like we have the Manhattan Swab, where we represent citizens, we can recruit people right out of Madison Avenue. We got the talent right here. Also, um, we have to remember that the Green NYC campaign, and quite frankly, I'm not sure what the exact status of that is, but they were active at, at, what, what, at one point, actually runs out of the mayor's office. So this may be something that we do in conjunction with other agencies and offices and let Department of Sanitation continue to do what they do well. Yeah, I think I need to sit down with uh, the city and the administration and just talk about this in a more holistic way. Um, you're right, because right now it's like banging my head against the wall to talk to them about increasing funding for an initiative that they want to accomplish in 10 years. It's, it's beyond me how they expect to do that without educating the public. So maybe I do need to have a different approach and it's a conversation with the administration as opposed to DSNY or exclusively DSNY. So yeah, I'll take that into account uh, for sure. Go ahead. Uh, just to, to respond to that point, maybe, maybe that does make sense. Maybe you can talk to the Mayor's Office of Sustainability about doing zero waste um, outreach through their office. However, by going back to Vision Zero, I don't think that uh, DOT has much of a hard time getting you know, their budget item for Vision Zero, which is also part of the mayor's one NYC. 
And, uh, and you know, and I want to make sure that we, you know, it's it's not apples to apples. It is orange, uh, apples to oranges when it comes to Vision Zero. We're they're, they're literally saving lives. Um, I think we're so we're doing it as well in, in like a climate change format. And so, so long term, we don't see the effects immediately. Um, uh, so so we, we you know the, our numbers are a little different. But I just still it's a, a long term for this, the survival of our planet it has value so you're right the mayor's office of sustainability is where the the one pl plan and one pl plan nyc was where we talked about the zero waste so maybe that's the place we should be going to to just have a better conversation about marketing for sure you're going to stay for the bottle bill eric for the testimony on the bottle bill absolutely are they a part of the coalition right now sure we can or canners no they're not although i think we're familiar with their views but we'll be happy to listen Good. to them once again yes Good, I'm glad, I'm glad. We're good? Yep, thank you. But Melissa, you were looking at me funny when I said we don't need to do the commercial waste uh, for DSNY just yet. What was it, was I confused or something? No, we can talk about it and, and continue the conversation. Um, you know, commercial waste zones aren't going to be fully implemented for a few years and the MTSs are all online and operational as of the end of this month. The Solid Waste Management Plan, as you know, contemplated that there would be one MTS exclusively for commercial, which has not even been a part of the conversation, and given that that's not, we as a city have the obligation to think of how do we rectify the situation and continue to bring equity into the conversation. Um, the passage of the waste equity law was a huge piece of it, but it was only the beginning. No, you're right. I hear that 100%. That, I know you share my. You said, piece, so. you said equity, so you got you, <laughs> you're pulling the, the the strings of my heart. So. Um, Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, and then the next group is uh, Pierre Simmons, Anna Martinez, and Chicago Crosby. Please come up. And this is the last panel. So this is the Mariano Rivera of the hearing. Hello, sister. Hi. Um, how do you guys want to do the testimony? Anyone start or? OK. OK. So please begin. Make sure the light is on. Is the light on? Is it on? OK. OK. Why New York City needs to support the expansion of the Returnable Containers Act? Oral testimony. Sure we can. You have to identify yourself for the record. Just so you know. Yes, I am. OK. Um, my name is Chicago Crosby, and next to me is Anna Marti Martinez De Loco, the co-founder of Sure We Can, and Mr. Pierre Simmons, who is um, a canner and the Sure We Can vice president. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Reynoso, and other members of the Sanitation and Solid Waste Management Committee. As I said before, my name is Chicago, and I'm a canner from bed Brooklyn, and I do business with Sure We Can three, four times a week, maybe sometimes more than that. We are not here today to ask for money. Rather, we are here to ask for your support for the proposed bottle bill expansion. We hear from some city leaders that the New York State bottle bill is in conflict with the New York City recycling programs operated by Sims Corporation. Yet in 2009, the City Department of Sanitation testified in favor of the bottle bill reform, BBBB, and until late 2017, the Department of Sanitation website reported that the bottle bill reduces litter by 70%, saves more than 52 million barrels of oils, and eliminates 200,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas each year. We are quite sure that the Sanitation Committee has received reports proving that the highest recycling diversion rates are a direct result of the deposit system. In 2018 alone, Sure We Can received and returned to distributors for recycling 785 tons of glass, 80 tons of plastic PET, and 65 tons of aluminum cans, close to 1,000 tons of containers. This is just a fraction of the amount of containers that are thrown away in the city each year. This waste diversion is accomplished without a penny of the city's money. For the past 11 years, 
We have received overwhelming public support and appreciation for our work. Although there has been some lack of clarity around the question of whether the work of canners is illegal or legal, Commissioner Garcia was kind enough to clarify that when canning is done on foot or bicycle using carts, as we do it, it is legal. Despite the legality of our work and the important contribution we make to New York City by diverting recyclable materials from the trash, the Office of Management and Budget have expressed concern that canners cause the city to lose money. We ask, how can the city lose money because of our work? If the five cent deposit is paid by the consumers and the handling fee is paid by the distributors, so extended producers' responsibility, nothing is for the city. We want to make the point that carners are not responsible for revenue losses in the city recycling program. We are all familiar with the contract that, we, that was signed in 2008 between SIMS and the Department of Sanitation. We had been told that the Department of Sanitation is committed to deliver to SIMS a quota of valuable recyclables. When they fall to do so, the city is required to compensate SIMS. We hear today about subsidies, whatever. As you know, the contract was based on the waste characterization study done on 2004 and 2005, the darkest year for recycling and canners. It was my first year of doing canning. Since the only redemption center we can, closed that year, and that gave birth to Sure Weekend because there was no other way to do. The contract has become effective, the contract that became effective the very same year as the reform battle bill includes the following provision. If the state enacts a battle bill change, a recyclable stream composition study shall be performed. They gave even 24 months for that. Today we ask, was such a study ever done? The city has been losing a lot of money for the past nine years, not due to us scanners, but because the recycling stream compensation study was never completed as far as we know. And we have researched it, believe me. Therefore, the quotas the city is required to deliver to SIMS have never been adjusted down from that based on 2004-2005 study. Even in response to real increase citizen participation in recycling through the deposit system. Due to a financial crisis of 2008-2009, as well as the opportunities the Battleville reform offered. There were many more canners who lose their job, so they went to canning, and there were many more who lose their business and went to redemption centers. From 2009-10 to 2011, we grew up at up to 50 redemption centers in the city, but that gave a lot of jobs to many people. We we, we the canners, we, we the canners are thousands of New York City residents walking the streets day and night to earn our nickels by picking up the containers left behind by others in trash cans, in recycling bags, in bars and restaurants, in parks, on the ground. As Francesca Bellardi, a journalist said, the great majority of canners collect any returnable container they find in their path and help keep streets clean. Some wait outside restaurants and bars. Others have agreements with superintendents of buildings so, they, so that they can go in the basements to sort the residents' waste. They don't simply pick up bottles and cans from clear bags. They sort everything, 
saving thousands of containers from black, from black bags, too. Bilotti knows well how candidates work and where they work through, the, through her, through her year-long reporting project on canners, documented on the website Canners New York Org. As she and others well know, we canners perform a service. Are we stealing from the city by carrying out the mandate of the bottle bill? Beyond its environmental and economic benefits to the city, the bottle bill has created thousands of jobs and income for so many thousands of people in the city. People like me, who for many reasons are, are not able to obtain other kinds of jobs, some may receive a disability check. But who can live in this city on disability alone? We survive thanks to the bottle bill. A study done by Unomia, Employment and Economic Impact of Container Deposits, shows that the deposit system in New York has created a robust industry of workers through the infrastructure that supports the system. The study foresees that a bottle bill modernization will result in much greater employment rate and economic benefits for all the attached in the summary of the report. Can, can I, so, sorry to interrupt you. So I want to, I guess I want to start by saying, yeah, go, go ahead, go ahead, finish your testimony. Turn on the mic, turn on the mic, the microphone. I talk loud and ask you. Bill de Blasio's plan for a strong and just city, known as One NYC, lays out a commitment to creating a dynamic, inclusive economy, a healthier environment. Despite its documented environmental benefits, there is no indication that the bottle bill has a place in the mayor's vision for a green future. And although the Department of Sanitation of New York City rebuilt their website and removed all information regarding the bottle bill, it is abundantly clear that the, bottle, that the deposit system is actually very effective for achieving these goals. We know, we know that there may not presently be a process for formally incorporating our grassroots work into the infrastructure of solid waste management, management as, as other big cities around the world have already done. We know that neither Canners nor Sure We Can will receive funding from this budget. All we ask from you present here today is to support the proposed bottle bill expansion that many of us are committed to, believe in, and in need of. Please do, do not side with private recycling industry, which is already opposing the bill expansions. Sims has issued a memo of opposition of the proposed bill expansion. Last Monday, it was presented to the Brooklyn Swab as the city, as, as the city position to the governor proposed bottle bill expansion. SIMS is not the same as the city. SIMS works for the city, but we work for the city too. SIMS receives multi-millions from, from the city budget. We receive unfair accusations, such as we're stealing. SIMS Metal Management is the world's largest listed metal and mining corporations with over 250 facilities and more than 4,800 employees globally, with an annual net income of more than 100 million, 120 million last 2017, to be shared among a handful of millionaires. We are a part of a global alliance of waste pickers, millions of human beings present on all continents, WW Global Rec Org. We are, re we are developing a popular economy making a living out of what others discard, while also making our city and the planet better for everyone. Today, we plead you, support the bottle bill expansion. 
Do the study the contract provides for, then adjust the quota so that the city, we, taxpayers, may not lose so much money for recycling, but increase its diversion rate. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Um, so I want to ask a couple of questions and get some clarifying points, I guess. Uh, um, what, is your, what is your take on what the bottle bill, the new bottle bill, the expansion is, is requesting? And how do you believe what the new bottle bill is doing benefits you? Um, we were longing that, uh, yeah. we were longing that the bottle bill will be open for renewal, reform, whatever. But we were feeling we can do anything. I mean, uh, even the handling fee was increased 10 years ago from two cents to three and a half cents. In 10 years in this city, everything has grown and increased hundreds percent. So we cannot move the, the three and a half cents by itself. The five cents deposit are 60, 70, even before the battle bill in, in New York, there was a deposit and it's five cents. 100 years ago was three cents put by the Coca-Cola themselves. So we always long for some reform, but we are helpless unless somebody from the government, government open it. So when governor announced on, June, on January 13 that for an expansion, that was a great news for all of us. It's not only the expansion, but it's to open the door for any other kind of improvement of that law after 10 years. So now I continue that even before you were asking me, I know the proposal of Sims. I was with Tom two nights ago and, and he was very happy to say, no, the idea is that you get all the glass and the plastics and the cans are for us. Very good, very generous. And because of that, I asked today Anita to sit down here with us. She's very afraid that I will ask her to talk. But I said, no, you just left that race. Levántate, levántate un poquito, levántate. Sí, solo. <laughs> Anita va a cumplir 81 años el 26 de julio. El año pasado lo celebramos los 80. Y carga muchos reciclajes, carga mucho y trabaja muchísimo. Entonces yo le dije a Tom, al de Sims, si personas como Anita pueden recoger solo vidrio, Anita recoge vidrio y a veces un carro que no puede empujar, pero si solo recoge vidrio es imposible, porque el plástico y el aluminio es light. And it's much easier to carry, much easier to work on it, even as redemption centers, eh, all that we do with glass, we don't cover even the labor, because it's double labor than the aluminum and the areas. But because seems is equal to the city, and they believe, and it seems that it is true, the rest of the city, we don't have any value. So can but I so can I say siéntese por favor no no quiero que yes, se, se canse. Gracias. Gracias. Um, y para todo lo que hablan español um, le quiero dar la gracia por estar aquí oír la voz de la voz es de ustedes que en, en mucho tiempo no se ha oído uh, tenemos una oportunidad aquí con esta ley que están proponiendo a, en el, en el estado no aquí en, en la ciudad en el estado um, que puede cambiar cómo se hace el trabajo de recolectar Um, la lata y el vidrio y, y cómo ustedes hacen su trabajo. Um, y yo voy a tener una conversación ahora con, con la hermana sobre cómo podemos hacer eso para que todo el mundo, todos puedan aprovechar. Ella ahora mismo habló de que tenemos mucha gente que si hay mucho vidrio se le hace difícil porque pesa mucho y no quieren solamente buscar vidrio, que quieren uh, asegurar que puedan también buscar um, latas de aluminio y plástico que eso es más liviano y le hace el trabajo más fácil. Ahora tenemos, vamos a tener la conversación la mayoría del tiempo en inglés y voy a tomar un tiempecito a lo último para a ver si puedo, uh, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Uh, summarize lo que, de lo que hemos hablado, ¿ok? Bueno, voy a seguir ahora en inglés y después vamos a salir de ahí. Um, so, the, Sims is not the city, but Sims has a contract with the city. So the contract 
obligates the city to provide Sims with a certain amount of goods so that they can they cover a quota. Once that quota is met, the city doesn't, is not responsible for paying them, but you know, is a helping achieve its goal of having high recycling rates, right? So you are right that Sims is not the city, but they have a contract with the city and are operating under that contract. And that's important for us to note that we have an obligation to them that we have to achieve. Um, so part of what they want are the valuable recyclables. Um, outside of the valuable recyclables, you know the commodities are extremely low and, and so forth, and glass seems to be like the least, uh, the least valuable product that we have here in the city of New York. Um, but if we were to raise the price on glass, for example, extremely high, at 25 cents a bottle, for an alcoholic bottle, for example, uh, 25 cents, as opposed to it being nothing right now, um, and lower the cost or, or maybe even eliminate the cost of what it costs to, uh, for the valuable items that we need to send to Sims, where we achieve a level of income that can be generated from a smaller number of bottles by the, by the canners, um, so they can continue to have a livelihood, uh, but we remove the things we don't want but can still be sorted and actually be more valuable if they're sorted appropriately. And then allow for Sims to get the rest of the items. Is, is there, a, I guess, that's not the solution, but is there a conversation to be had in allowing for you guys to play an even bigger role, an, an even larger role, in being able to assist us with managing our recycling here in the city? Okay, I will answer with the other way. Um, the city has a contract with Sims to help, I guess, recycling better. No, that was, I guess, the purpose of that contract. It's surprising that Sims, being a multinational corporation, is only with New York City who has recycling program. The rest is mining and metal. But anyway, for whatever reason, they were able to get that contract, and you are happy with it. Now, when we talk, and uh, these days also about, uh, and we have conversations with sanitation, um, we talk as if the only problem that we have is to make sure that Sims make money. I mean, if that is the main priority of all of us, you tell us. All we want is that Sims meets, its, that the city meets its contractual obligation to Sims. Okay. No now, more, no okay. less. That's our goal. I read from, from the contract that you did or whoever did with, with Sims. Updating the composition tables based on a study. Battle bill changes. And what is that? What is that that you're reading? The contract. The contract for Sims and the city. Sims and the city. Okay. okay. Mm, here says clearly that if the battle, if the state enacts a battle bill change, which could happen hopefully this year again, but this was in 2008, then as soon as practicable in light of the time required for the effect of such action, action to be reflected in collections, but not even, not in no event later than 24 month, months after the effective day of the change, a recyclable stream composition study shall be performed with respect to the MGP recycling stream. So the city is responsible for yes. doing a study 24 months after a bill yes. is passed. Yes, within, within these 24 months. Now, of, of the, within the 24 months of after the bill is passed. After the bill so is the passed. So the state has to pass the new bottle bill, yes. and then we have to have a yes. study 24 months after that. Yes. Okay. But this was not done in 2009 to 2011, which it changes totally the, 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 the characterization of 2004, 2005. So the real reason is that somebody did not do that job. Because if that job was done, I mean, it seems we don't like people to recycle better. But at the same time, we talk about zero waste. And, and, and so, so can you explain to me what you think the and, and I just want to be yeah. I want you to inform me what you think the value of that study would be that's in the, the the study that you're talking about that 
uh, the city is obligated to yeah. do if yeah. if there's a if there's a change to the bottle bill? Can yeah. you explain to me what you think the why is that valuable? Well, why, why would that be important? Let's see. Let's see that um, that this bill passes this year. Not only passes expansion, but passes many other things, which people were working on it. Now, the quota that you are obliged to seems will have to change because people will recycle it much more. And in fact, the highest rate of diversion rate is the one through the deposit, if you know. And it's not just people getting from the bags, it's people from, from our but, neighbors. Yeah, but you're saying that the contract, so I, I just, I never read that, and now that you have it, I, I will see. read it, I, I will see. read it. Um, it's interesting. What you're saying is that if we do a study, the study would allow us to be informed as to what's being recycled, and then the city's obligations to Sims would be modified yes. according yes. to what's yes. being recycled? Yes, Okay. because there is another part who says here, um, yeah. So sister, what about if, let me, let me, I'm just gonna give an example. Let me read the last But your, your problem is with Sims, and I don't want it to be with Sims. I want, your, I want you to when, just take care of the people that you're representing outside Sims, of Sims. When Sims says the other day, this is the city's position, I believe, and the way you talk is exactly, I mean, two nights ago, Sims representative was telling me that of the glass, exactly the same that today it is talking. Right, because we, but so I want to, so look, Sim, so forget about Sims, like we're talking now, right? I want to get a good position, right? I don't want to get Sims position. In my head, it makes a lot of sense to encourage canners to take the things that we don't want in the system out and get paid for that. Who, so is, that who is we don't want? Who is we don't want? The, we the city wants to achieve what? It's obligation yeah. to Sims. Forget about Sims, you said. Forget about no, no, Sims. No, 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 no. So I, the, you're, not, you're not understanding. I have an obligation to Sims. Unfortunately, I want to be honest with you, right? I, ca I care about you deeply, sister. But the obligation contractually to Sims is important. We have to meet that so that we're not spending money. Like, it, it might be a bad contract, but it's a contract. We but have a lot of bad contracts contract in the city. can be modified, and from day one has a provision that if the bottle bill changes, can be modified. And if the bottle bill changes what? Can be modified the contract. Right, so you're water. saying that forget about Sims, they'll be able to, we'll be able to take care of them after the modification oh, because of the... you said you are obliged to Sims, and because of that you want to remove yes, things we are in, in order to give the obligations. That, but I am saying, instead of do that, but why what don't value you does it have for you, it's a sister? What does it matter if it's all about money for you, right? Like we want to make sure. For us, no, it's no, not listen, money. No, for us, it's much more. For it's not about maybe oh it's money, God. but yes. for us, it's much more. No, I want to make sure that the canners make as much money as possible. No, no you are not. Okay. So okay. You might disagree yes. that what I'm saying is mm. doing that. I agree with that. Yes. yes. So I'm trying to learn so that I can help you achieve your goal of getting more money for canners. What about if we do save uh, the the five cents for aluminum? the five cents for plastics, and then 25 cents for this heavy glass. So that we added, and it, we expanded the bottle bill, but are giving a higher price to the thing that we want out of the stream, to a group of people that do a very good job at sorting that. So that you can still make your money off of aluminums and off of plastics, your five cents that you're used to, but now there's another item that's included in the bill that it costs a lot more than both of those combined. You so now what we're doing is we want to encourage the removal of this glass from the system by, by incentivizing canners to take that product because it's the more valuable product. How is, so all we did in this, in my scenario, and I'm just making it up now in my scenario, all we did was add another product to the stream at a much higher rate. How is that not helpful? So you could continue to do your plastics and your, and your aluminums. But not to add. Accord, no. Not the expansion. What expansion? Not to add. You're the saying expansion of the governor's proposal. I just I just told you we expanded to include this new glass, this um, the, the the alcoholic beverage glass for 25 cents, let's say. No, but the proposal is to expand um, uh, sweet water, cider, a lot of other things that were not. Nasty yeah, we, not. I think we so, should, yeah, we should, I'm not saying we shouldn't expand. I think what we should be doing, though, is using the money, right? So I, I, look, it's not about expansion. 
It's about using the money to, to let things go one way or let things go the other way. Not using money to, to eliminate your jobs or to help Sims. It's like, what do we want in the recycling stream? Let's make sure that that number is lower than what we don't want in the stream, and let's make that higher. You can expand it across the board. Whatever we want recycled, we should maybe have a, a monetary tie to it. But and again, why said, not charge more or give more in a deposit yeah. for things that we don't want in the stream that you will get paid for? When, when you said we don't want, who are we? I, I asked. So, exactly. So, let's, the market. There you go. Who if it has market? a market and it's valuable, we want to, the city of New York wants to keep that. If it is not valuable and it doesn't have a market, they want that to be out of the stream. City. Who is the city of New York? Who is the city of New York? The, the market. The market Sister. is the city. Okay. No, no, no. It's, nah. it's a matter of Sister, you're not, you're, it's a, the market. Yeah. What is, is aluminum more valuable than, than glass? I want to ask you. You tell me about the market. Is aluminum more valuable than glass? I don't ever sell neither aluminum nor glass, so I don't know. So, okay, so, so then that, that's a big problem then, and sister, that we should have a conversation about. Because what we're saying is whatever has market value, actual market value, right, that we put a lower value to that so that it stays in the stream and the bad guys at Sims could get it. What we're saying, if it doesn't have any market value, there's no real value to it because we can't resell it somewhere, we can't recycle it, it can't be reused, and if it does, it's at a high, it's at a low cost. What we want to do is take those out of the stream because that's just heavy, but it doesn't have any value to it. And it definitely doesn't have any value if it's all mixed in. So what we're saying is if it doesn't have any market value, that we increase the value for its deposit so that you can take it out of the stream, get paid more for taking that out, right? So now the city doesn't need to worry about it, and then the consumer responsibility, the, the, the folks that are, you're still going to get your money. So we're, it's not about, it's a market. We just want to make sure that we're playing to that. And that you guys can help us play to that and no, still make no, money. we cannot help you that. <laughs> we Excuse really me? cannot help you that. And I tell you. You can't what? And I no, can't what? we cannot help you that. We you can't help us with no, that. No, no. Why is that? First, because, at least for me, I'm so appealed to know that you are, you as Chairperson of Sanitation Committee are worried and thinking about the value of the recyclables. When in fact, uh, most of the people who talk today, maybe one or two not, they were talking about doing all the possible ways so that people will recycle better, will divert better, and now you are calculating whether it's more value. So two years ago, the paper was value. This today, the paper has no value. So maybe Kenneth could get the, the paper. Uh, three years ago, it was, the, nine years ago, the only valuable for sims was cans, aluminum cans. They were really after that. Uh, no, no, they found market for the, for the pet. And you will tell me you are not talking as sims? You talk exactly the same than sims. And then, I am so, so sorry maybe, to say so, that. So it's okay, so maybe my, my thoughts about how we achieve this are aligned with Sims. But why don't you believe that if the expansion is real, and yes, increase, increase the handling fee, or increase the deposit, why don't you believe that many more people won't throw, as some of people said in the, in the refuse, any recyclable? Anything that has value, people, people of our neighborhood do not throw to, to, to garbage. So, even in Manhattan, if there is a greater value, many more things will be recyclable, and it will be recyclable best. And again, it's proven, and you have heard it from Unomia, that the highest recycle rate is because of the deposit, and it's worldwide. We so agree with now, that. We agree with why that. Why do you like to keep some for seams, but the others we can recycle? You could recycle both of them. Let's say we don't have a zero. There's no zeros. And how do you could continue to recycle the way you do the cans and the plastics. But if there's more value on a different product, I feel like your canners are going to go after the product that has more value. Not, not value to the market, value through the deposit. Forget about the market. They're going to go after the value of the deposit. If we say that cup is worth $1, the canners will be paying attention to that product. Canners won't see this. What do you if mean? you say this is one dollar value, that's true. Then the people will throw it out because they don't have its value. You remember the the metro cart were all around in the ground. The moment they are one one dollar value, 
you don't see. At times you lost your own and you cannot find, you have to buy one. So even when you said the bottle, the wines, whatever, 25 cents, you will bring your bottle to the store. I mean, all of us will bring our own bottles if it is 25 But, per but that's not happening with the, with, with the aluminum cans and the plastic bottles. They do have value, because it's but it's five not cents, happening. Because it's five cents. Right. But if it is 25 cents, the bottle of, the, the can of Coca-Cola, you will see how everybody will return. And, and that is nothing bad, it's, it's good. I mean, we don't mind that, and we don't mind that people will re return more. But why that kind of, for this is value, for this, and again, I believe, and you said yourself, you never read this contract, and no, I, did I, not. I understand it's 400 pages, believe me. Huh? <laughs> but this page that and I can give you is <coughs> just to tell us that if only I mean, you don't need to pay any subsidy, anything special to, to, to Sims, if you were able to do this, which is the bottle will change. 10 cents, 15 cents, everything, even, even containers, water containers, whatever, has deposit. Many people will recycle much better. Now, you adjust the quota because this is what the, this article says. It will so, allow us to adjust the quota. Yes. And, and that's said, a good thing. And they said, imagine, they said, um, in the case of a bottle bill enhancement, increase the diversion of aluminum pet, so, from curbside collections to redemption centers, the contractor shall be compensated beyond the effect of the new recyclable string composition study. So, when this is whatever re reform, and the biggest, the better, in, in the 24 months continuous, do the study. And only whatever comes in that study, you are committed to Sims. Now, if suddenly that is not so, enough. So, uh, sorry, I, I'm j I just want you to clarify for me. So what you believe that does is that once the study says, in our stream, we only have plastic bottles, yeah. So our obligation now constitutes that we only have to give you plastic bottles because that's what's in the stream. That, that, 20, that, that allows you to modify yeah. your obligation to them to only giving them what's in the stream. Yes, yes. And the volume that is in the study. But it's something that... So what I'm going to do is I want to take, so that we're not here um, all day, yeah. I'm going to take time to uh, read that contract yeah. so that we could understand it better with the committee. But I guess what I'm trying to tell you that no one's against you right now. It feels like that. I get it. And I want to be clear. It feels like that because people are listening to Sims um, because they're the big bad wolf in, in the room and they're not listening to you. But that is not the goal, right? The goal is not to make Sims happy. The, the goal, I believe, is ultimately to uh, begin the process of removing unvaluable items from the recycling stream. That's what I, and I'm talking about unvaluable in the market. Now, if you don't, you don't believe that, that's fine, but we are gonna, that's what we're fighting for. That's I what I'm fighting for. I sorry because there is no we. I, I would like to Antonio, hear. Antonio I Reynoso. Write, I, I will hear the, the whole committee. Council member Antonio that's Reynoso right. yes. is trying to figure out a way that we do something that is productive for us to get our recycling rates up, but also allowing for us to remove things in the recycling, in the, in the stream that we don't want. And if you have an opportunity to do that in your system, then we want to figure out a way to pay you for that. So we, I want to have a conversation with you so that we're on the same page. What I don't want is that I can't advocate on your behalf because you've drawn a very clear line. If your line is Sims versus us and that's it, then we're, we're, you're going to lose and we can't do that. What we need to do <coughs> is help build a coalition where we can come to a compromise that works for everyone. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to understand you. I'm not trying to dictate anything to you. I'm trying to explain to you the logic behind why people are doing what they're doing. And I feel like you think it's exclusively doing it to try to satisfy Sims. And I don't think that's it. They're environmental justice people that don't care about Sims. They care about the environment. And they want to do something that can help the environment. And if they can help the environment by modifying how we recycle, that's what they're going to try to do outside of Sims' thought. They just want to help the environment. And if in helping that environment, you can continue to make your money or make more money, and that's like an added benefit, that's what we want to do. So I just want you to know that's the premise, the foundation by where we're coming. 
Now, if you believe how we're talking is too Sims-centric, then we'll have a conversation so we could be better at it. I, con I consider you the foremost recycling, like canning expert. So I wanna make sure that you're a part of that conversation. You, I hope you heard my testimony and my conversation with sanitation about listening to you, bringing you to the table. That's real, and I wanna do that. Without my advocacy, that's very hard for to happen. So I just want you to know that I'm on the same team, on the same page. I know you don't feel like that right now, but as I learn and I get informed, I think we're gonna get closer to you where you wanna get to. This morning came this, this article, I mean this study, Battle Bill expansion and the benefits. So I will also give to you. You you put fine in the web, but I will give to you. I and that's the happy. and you feel like that's a strong, like expl explainer of where you stand. But yeah, no, it explained very well the jobs, the recycling levels, everything because of the expansion. So even the actual one, but much more when it is expanded. So at least those of us who are in the environmental mind and the economic of the people, we agree with all this, but I don't know, I can give to you. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Welcome. thank you for that. Thank you for your testimony, by the way, I really appreciate you taking the time to get here. Thank you. I'm gonna just uh, try my best to summarize it in Spanish very quickly so we could close the hearing. Um, la conversación que teníamos con la hermana, um, hablamos de los lo beneficios, de tra cómo podemos, de parte mía, trabajar juntos para buscar una solución que trabaja para todo. Um, ella en este momento no se siente cómoda con la conversación, cómo se está moviendo en la ciudad. Ella cree que está muy, muy uh, alineado a Sims en vez de alineado a lo, a lo, a lo que están recogiendo la botella. Um, y también cre crees que dándole valor a un producto, vamos a decir, dándole 25 centavos a un producto, lo va a hacer que nadie lo va a meter en, en la que no lo van a dejar en la calle, que se lo van a llevar y ellos mismos lo van a cambiar porque tiene mucho valor. Que aunque nosotros creemos que lo que va a pasar es que ustedes van a tener acceso a esa botella, lo que va a pasar es que la gente que lo tienen en la casa lo van a guardar y van, vamos a decir, porque ahora es 25 centavos en vez de 5, ahora sí con 100 me, tengo mi dinero um, y no lo vamos a dejar en la calle. Porque si la dejamos en la calle, el dinero le llega a ustedes, no a, le llega a ustedes y no a la gente que tiene la botella. Ella cree que es un problema, que tiene un problema, que no puede ser tan alto que lo hace que nosotros lo queremos, queremos quedarnos con ellos. Tiene que ser un, una cantidad que es suficiente para que la gente pueda reciclar, pero no tanto que la gente no lo deja en la calle. Y eso es lo que estamos hablando ahora. Yo también le estoy diciendo que el interés de ella aunque ella no lo crea en este momento, es el interés de nosotros, de, de mí, de Antonio Reynoso. Pero tengo que aprender más, tengo que educarme más sobre lo que está pasando para asegurar que yo pueda luchar para lo que ella quiere. Um, pero creo que con una conversación que no sea tan de un lado a otro, que donde hay compromiso, donde podemos hablar, um, se puede lograr más que estar peleando de, en, en diferentes lugares. Yo me veo como un un socio de ustedes, pero no me sentí así hoy, porque la, la hermana va a decir que yo no soy socio. <ríe> pero yo voy a comenzar el proceso de educarme más para ponerme en una posición a donde pueda ayudar. Y ella me va a dar una información para yo leer la posición de ella y también un contrato que explica cómo podemos cuidar que el contrato se puede modificar para asegurar que la ciudad de Nueva York no sea, no sea obligado de lo que tienes en su obligación con Sims. Pues yo voy a leer y me voy a educar más para ver cómo puedo ayudarlo. Eso es lo que estoy diciendo. Eso es lo que dijo. Yo creo más o menos eso es lo que hablamos. Um, y me gusta, me, me alegro que están aquí hoy, otra vez. Thank you so much for everyone being here. I think we're at the end. I didn't think we would get to five o'clock, um, but we got to 5.20. Uh, longer than I expected it, but it's always, it's always good. Thank you so much for today and have a good day. We're adjourned. Uh, amiga, es que era, esto es un, un testimonio público. Usted podía sentarse y hablar como toda la gente.